complexes. All right, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, college tonight. Um, the college consists of the following format. First, we'll have our uh, brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak up to about an hour. Then we'll have questions and answers. And then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. Generally, we will go till about nine o'clock or so, but since we're on Zoom, it's not a hard uh, deadline. So if we really get into it, we can stick around. After the uh, college is finished, we generally just hang around on the Zoom call until we're all done. But the formal festivities will end about nine-ish or so. Okay, um, Charlie, uh, if you wanna give announcements for upcoming programs and everything else, uh, please go ahead. All right, I wanna welcome everyone. The meeting number 3,647 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, I've got four quick announcements to begin with. Uh, first of all, happy winter solstice to everyone <coughs> on December 21st. For those of you who don't, don't acknowledge that holiday of rabid consumerism, that the capitalists want you to celebrate. Okay, winter solstice on the 21st, longest night of the year. Huh. Um, number two, we have two ways of learning about upcoming programs. We have a Google group, email group, which you are welcome to sign up for, the instructions on our website. And we also have a meetup group. You get one or two notices per week on the upcoming programs. Three, uh, they, we're gonna take a little break. Uh, there'll be no meetings on December 25th and January the 1st. And the next meeting will be January the 8th. Um, let's see, the next open date, if you'd like to speak is March 19th, March 19th. Uh, and last of all, since the topic tonight is revolutions, you're all invited to look at during the holiday, our lecture library. And there are many, many programs listed there, maybe some that you had missed. If you look on July of 2018, you will find an excellent lecture by Charles Paydock on the history of revolutions. So I highly recommend you take a, a look at those. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We have 10 programs coming up in 2022. By the way, the anniversary of the college is January the 6th. And I think we're something like 71 years old. So, uh, okay, not January the 8th. Uh, a group called America Walks. We'll talk some about pedestrian ad advocacy and life in sustainable communities. <laughs> On January the 15th, I see the Libertarian Party guy is here. Uh, they're going to try to convince us uh, to uh, not like government. So we'll see how well yeah. uh, Justin does. <laughs> January the 15th. On January the 22nd, a new group out of New York, I believe, they are seeking a just society, a society with justice. We're going to find out how they, uh, all their activities and efforts in that regard. On January the 29th, the farm workers will be telling us about conditions in the fields. They're going to line up some uh, uh, farm workers and bilingual program translated from Spanish into English. They'll be telling us about working conditions in the field. At February the 5th, uh, this is a good program. I've seen it once already. Uh, we're going to learn all about um, from Ken Williams. This is a good program on what's wrong with the Democratic Party. Uh, we could go on all night with that topic. No, but they have figured that, that they how to leftist, improve the Democratic Party, if at all possible. February the 12th, 
hey man, the Green Party is going to be here. And they're telling us, they're going to give us how you can get initiatives on the ballot. And then we're going to be circulating a petition to get the polluters all out of Chicago, run them out of town. So don't miss this program. ILGP on February the 12th. February the 19th, we're going to get into foreign affairs with uh, Stanfield Smith. He usually gives us the detail yeah. programs of, of very good significance. Uh, this is should be a hot one on Venezuela. All kinds of opinions floating around out there. Most <laughs> of them completely <laughs> erroneous. Completely erroneous. On March the 5th, I see he's here tonight. You mean you had and, you, forgot, you forgot February 26th, Charlie. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're right. This is a new program. Uh, a historian of technology. He's yeah. wrote a book all about people think there's going to be high tech driving. And we're going to take a look at this. Is it feasible? Where you just get in your car and kind of mm -hmm. take it easy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, electronic guideways and self-driving cars. Good luck with that one. But anyhow, that's on February the 6th. On March the 5th, Dan Weinberg usually does a well a lot of research. He's worried that we won't have any food or water anymore. So this is an important topic. Um, and we're going to run out of food and water pretty soon, I guess. He says, on February the 12th, we're going to take a look at the war on Nicaragua, Los Sandinistas. Oh. Uh, so uh, on the 12th. Anyhow, uh, that's it. Oh. Uh, um, anyhow, take it away, Tim. Thank you very much. All right. I just want to let everybody know that we do have a uh, we do have a Dallas campus that's there. I'm not sure what they're doing right now yet for, uh, for upcoming programs, but uh, they do meet on Thursday nights. And uh, I'm not sure if they have any speakers up yet or not. But uh, their next meeting is January the sixth. And what the who are they? Uh, and they who's... haven't scheduled anyone yet. Okay, so. You know, you're welcome to, if you, if you want to get you into your college, there's also meet on Thursday nights. All right. Um, with that, are there anybody else who has an announcement for the good of the uh, good of the college? If not, we can uh, then have our uh, speaker, uh, Reverend Charlie Earp, to uh, take for the next Thank hour or so and tell us about other. his things. We just ask again that everybody mute during his presentation. Uh, and then at the end of the, I'll, I got a mute button on my microphone, so, you know, I'll be able to so, see it there. So, you know, I might not officially be muted, but I'll definitely keep my sound off during the thing. Um, so if uh, everybody is ready, uh, Reverend Charlie Earp, if you want to take it away, go ahead and uh, start your presentation. And we'll be uh, sitting in rapt attention until you're uh, done, and then we'll be... Uh, blasting you with questions. Thanks, Tim. Um, I do have a question. How long should I talk? Because I I can honestly talk for an hour. So well, let's, let, let's just get, we, we, we uh, at 6.23 now, finish about 7, 7.10, 7 7.20, depending right? on how good it goes. Just uh, the last thing we want is just a boring speaker. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a good rapt attention, we'll uh, we'll right. hear you and uh, be okay. ready to uh, listen. So I'll to just, I'll aim for about 20, 30 minutes, maybe not that much, but we'll see. Well, it's, it's six twenty three now. I mean, we'll have a ton yeah. of questions, so if oh, you right. need the time, take the time. Okay. No, I don't. I don't need the time. I have more than I can possibly fit, so I need to know. You know, I'll give oh. myself an idea. And thirty minutes. Twenty five minutes is fine. Yeah, I'm gonna say 30 okay. minutes tops. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Um, Be ready to get blasted during the question and answer period. I understand. I've done this before. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. I'm ready to go. If and everybody's muted, I'd appreciate you know, no no uh, audio distractions if possible. Okay. Um, my name is Charlie Arp. 
Uh, yes, I am a reverend. I am an ordained minister. Um, I've been working on ordination for a number of years with the Unitarian Universalist Association, which is the the most liberal, most in some definitions left wing denomination. Um, <coughs> some people once said that the Unitarian Universalists are a church where even atheists feel comfortable because there's no imposed belief. And that's generally true, although we do have um, Unitarian Universalists have a kind of set of expectations. You need to kind of be left of center politically for the most part. Um, and, you know, you can't be too dogmatic in whatever you do believe. I'm also, though, a member of the People's Church of Chicago, which is also in the United Church of Christ, which is probably the most left wing of American Protestant, white Protestant, majority white Protestant denominations. There are, you know, black churches that are to the left conceivably of most white Christians. So I am, I have a dual identity as a minister in that I am both in the UUA, but I'm also connected to the United Church of Christ. Um, wait a minute, I'm gonna start a timer for myself. Okay, um, so what I'm talking about tonight, I'm calling this, uh, I call this the Church of the Revolution, which is my name I've given to my social media presence. Um, I'm going to put in, let's see, I've got a, did I do this already? But I'm gonna do it again. I think I already put my link up. Did I? I did not. Okay. I'm going to put up a link in the Zoom chat. So bear with me. I'm going to go off camera for just a moment because I thought I had the link copied, but I don't. So this link is um, a link tree, which is my, which is a website that allows you to sort of create a directory for yourself of all your social media um, forums. And so I'm going to put this in the chat so that anybody who would like to know more about what I do off outside of this venue can see it. So let me send, whoop, let me send my link. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Everyone. All right, here we go. I'm sending my link. So there's my link. You can go there to see what I'm doing, um, I think one of the more interesting things that I've done in the past year is my YouTube channel. Uh, I have a few hours of content up there that I put together uh, starting in January through like March or April. So the YouTube channel is probably the most complete um, elaboration of my, my project. Um, so this is my fourth appearance at the College of Complexes. My very first one was in 2012 in December. And the title at that time was Jesus Made Me a Communist. And um, Tim reminded me, Tim Bolger reminded me that that's still up on the College of Complexes. Tim Bolger's YouTube channel still has that talk from December of 2012. If you just Google Jesus Made Me a Communist, you'll find it. So how did that happen? Why did I call my, why did I give that story that Jesus made me a communist? I was born into a Pentecostal family. My father was a Pentecostal preacher. Um, so I was raised with all of the beliefs of that particular tradition. You know, the Bible is the word of God. Um, sinners are gonna go to hell forever. Jesus died for our sins, et cetera. I, I had all that belief system. And for a good bit of my life until my mid thirties, I would have I said I was pretty much a true believer. Um, in 1986, after years of trying to figure out how to be an adult, because I graduated high school in 82. So about four years after graduating, I was married. I had my first child. We were living in Dallas, Texas. Um, I decided that God was calling me to live in a commune. And so we moved to Evanston, Illinois, which is where I live now, to live with a commune. And if you're curious about the commune, it's Reba Place Fellowship. You can Google them. They're still around. They've been around since 1957. It's one of the longest lived urban communes in the world. I'm gonna say in the world. Um, they're not very big. They have a church that's a little bit bigger than the commune, but the, you don't have to be a member of the commune to be in the church. But I was a member of their church for about nine years and lived with the community. And I still live with the community, although there was a period of time I did not. I am not a member of the Reba Place Fellowship nor of the Reba Place Church. I am a member, as I've stated, the People's Church of Chicago. But as I said, the story is that 
this Pentecostal preacher's kid felt Jesus telling me to go live in a commune. And I did that for nine years and I was exposed during those years to liberation theology. And if you've ever heard of liberation theology, it is a socialist theology that emerged in Latin America. It was also black liberation theology, which emerged almost identical period, time period in the late 60s. But black liberation theology was based more on black power, whereas um, Latin American liberation theology was based on Marxism essentially, and on, on underdevelopment in particular in Latin American countries. And liberation theology was initially sort of kicked off by Catholics, but there are a lot of Protestants who have embraced liberation theology, which is a, as I say, is a socialist theology that says, um, you know, capitalism is against the will of God. It is inhuman, it is inhumane. And we you probably all have heard some version of a critique of capitalism. I won't go into that tonight in much detail, but I could. I could go on, like I said, I've got way more content than I can ever get through in an hour, let alone half an hour. So I, um, in, after being at the uh, College of Complexes in 2012, I began my path to going to seminary and becoming a professional minister. I am 58 years old, so this was kind of a big deal. To quit my travel industry job, I've been working in the travel industry for 14 and a half years. And I decided I wanted to become a full-time minister, that I was gonna be um, doing communism and Jesus as my ministry for um, my full-time career. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still working on it. I mean, not a lot of churches want a overt communist in their pulpit. Even the most liberal, liberal Unitarian churches are a little squigged out by a, someone calling themselves a communist. So a minister, you know, a church is supposed to have a creed. I don't have a creed per se. I don't care what you believe about how many heads of angels can dance on pins. I don't care about specific theological claims. My only claim is that Jesus was an anti-plutocracy advocate. He did not believe the wealthy should rule the world. He was absolutely opposed to that. And because of that, he, in my opinion, planted a seed in Western civilization that became Marxism, that became socialism, that became communism. So yes, I think retroactively, I can say that Jesus was a communist. So that's a belief. Now, but what does it mean to be a communist? And I have a fairly distinct and clear definition of what I mean. And this is my creed. If you have a creed, I wrote this tonight. I believe it is possible to create a world where there is no poverty, no white supremacy, no patriarchy, no ecocide, no oligarchy, no homophobia, no militarism, and no religious fascism. That's my definition of communism is all those negations. And instead of capitalism, instead of poverty, we would have a global abundance shared by all the poor and the rich will get sent away empty as, as Mary, the mother of Jesus said in her song in Luke chapter one, she said, God will send the rich away empty. And Jesus said, the rich will be sent away hungry. So the, you know, God says, basically, if you've had, you've had more than your fill of this life's blessings and bounty, the, the poor are now going to have it all. And that's what I believe. That's my communism. But it includes, again, I'm opposed to white supremacy. I'm opposed to patriarchy. I'm opposed to homophobia. I'm opposed to war, militarism. Now, of course, as a socialist, I have to agree with Eugene Debs. There's only one war I'll ever fight in, and that's a global class war. So bring it on. All right. So what I believe, I call my theology the communism of universal love because I think that in the 20, 20th century, communism has been propagandized by the capitalist press and the capitalist intelligentsia as a system of imposed violence and a system of control and, and the KGB and the secret police and 
purges and all that. And all those things did happen in communist, supposedly communist-led countries. It doesn't mean that everybody who was a communist approved of such tactics. But the countries which became ruled by communist parties, and you know their names, the Soviet Union, China, the Eastern European nations, those countries did fight for their lives and they attacked. No, the KGB was a part of the capital, the communist ruling class in Russia, the Soviet Union. I was just saying that I'm talking about the tactics that, that have been used to sort of blacken communism as a terrible system has been things like the KGB, things like the purges, things like um, mass starvation that occurred. There were famines in China and Mao got blamed for them because famines apparently don't happen anywhere else, right? Only where some a communist is in government. We know that's bullshit. There are plenty of famines in Africa going on without communism causing a famine. Famines aren't caused by communism, but that's beside the point. All of that negativity, all of that violence that has been built up as if capitalism is a nonviolent system that allows everybody to just compete peacefully it's bullshit. It, it isn't true. And yes, I am a pre I am a preacher who cusses, and I'll probably cuss, and I might even drop an f bomb if I feel like it. All right. So when I talk about the communism of love, I'm talking about what Jesus said. Jesus said, and I'm going to here go to the Bible. Now, um, here I'm going to Luke chapter six, and this is um. This is called the Sermon on the Plain. Most people have heard of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but this is Luke's version of that same discourse, but he tells a very different version of his story. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, blessings to the poor, for God's kingdom belongs to them. Blessings to the hungry, you will be given a feast. And blessings to those who are mourning and weeping, you will know joy and laughter. Because people will hate you, they will ostracize you because you stand up for the justice of the Son of Man, the Son of God. Rejoice on that day. But then Jesus said, damn the rich, or cursed, or woe to the rich, because you've already gotten more than enough. And damned and cursed are the well-fed. You will be deprived and hungry. And damned are those who are mirthful and joyful in this life because you will be brought to grief and weeping. All right, Jesus said that. I didn't say that. Do we have a problem with it? You have a problem with Jesus, and that's fine. Like I said, I'm not here to push a particular understanding of Jesus, except that he was a communist. But what you believe, whether he was a son of God, or you believe he was a prophet, or you believe he was an, a, a myth, you can believe he was a myth. I don't care. The story of Jesus, in my mind, has been a spur in the side of radicalism throughout Western history. It has been a spur to the radicals of the Munster Rebellion in Germany. Um, they've been the spur to the radicals of the diggers in England. They have been a spur to the Hutterites, the Anabaptists who created communes that still exist to this day. They are the largest existing communist ne communal network, not communist country. Um, Solidarity in Poland. I, I'm not going to comment on solidarity in Poland. That is a controversial topic um, because we know what's going on in Poland, right? Well, I should say there is a right wing government in Poland right now, and they claim to be carrying out what solidarity wanted. That's so funny. The right wing likes to, when they're not attacking the left, they're trying to claim credit for the left. <laughs> whole other, whole other debate. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Okay. Looks like I've got about 17 minutes. Let me look at my notes because I had, like I said, I have a lot of content. So what I'm doing now, um, I am trying to get hired by a church, but it's a really terrible time because of the pandemic to try to work for a church. I worked for a church for about 10 months in 2020 and 2021, but it was all on Zoom. It was all, I didn't get to meet these people in person. And, you know, they felt like I wasn't quite what they were looking for. And that's fine because I realized I'm not your average preacher, whether you 
you know, I, I don't want to be, I want to be a communist. Now, the question that I want to answer is why start a church for communism? Why not start another communist party? And I want to say, because it's been done to death. How many communist parties have there been in the history of the United States alone? There's just been so many little fractions and, you know, the Trotskyists and the Maoists and the Hojaists and the I tried, I was a member of the Socialist Party for, for like seven or eight years. And I just found that party building is a lot of work. There you go, <laughs> 12 billion jillion parties in 1968 alone. That's right. There was, I'm not building a communist party. I, somebody will do that. Someday there will have to be, if we're gonna have a global communist revolution, there will have to be an international coalition of communist parties to win that global revolution. It's not my job. I, I'm not an activist, actually. I'm, I am a religious fanatic, if you haven't figured that out already. And I know religion. I have been professionally trained to be a minister and a pastor to people. And so I want to do that, but make the theology of the communism of love the center. And that's what I want to do. That's why I'm starting the Church of the Revolution online every Saturday, Sunday night, every Sunday night at 730 on Twitch, Twitch TV. If you if you know what Twitch is, this is a new streaming platform started out, um, you know, it was just live streaming. Then it became a gaming live streaming. People would go on and play these these uh, video games for hours with audiences watching them play these games. And that was Twitch. But then Twitch opened it up and said, we could also do other kinds of live streaming. So now it's the current popular live streaming app. And that's the one I've chosen to base the Church of the Revolution live on Sunday nights at 7.30. And uh, I started that on November 28th. Um, and I meet every Sunday night for about an hour, well, about 30 minutes to 90 minutes. It really depends on the audience. If I have a big audience one night, I could be there till nine and I could even stay later if, if the audience <laughs> wants to keep talking, they want to keep you know, engaging with me. But I'm just doing this and hoping that people will find that my message is appealing to them. And again, I'm not trying to get you, well, I believe that we have a problem and I stated it, my confession. I believe we have a world with too much poverty. In fact, I want a world with no poverty. We have too much white supremacy. I want fully multiracial, intercommunal, you know, cooperation globally, worldwide. I don't want men running the world. I would rather women run the world. And of course, women and men running the world together. But you got to you got to have a revolution first. See, that means overthrow all the men who are in charge and put women in charge. I don't want ecocide. We have a climate catastrophe. I mean, who was paying attention to all the tornadoes that swept through Kentucky and Arkansas and and just killing hundreds of people? We don't want that. And that's what industrial capitalism has bequeathed to us is this degenerating ecosphere. And we need to stop it. We also have an oligarchy. I mean, in the United States, the president barely wins a majority, in fact, often loses by a majority, and yet is in because of the Electoral College, which is set up to create an oligarchy. It's all, it originally was set up, you had to be a wealthy white landowner, and Blacks were three-fifths of a human being. You know, we've changed some of those things, but we need to get rid of the concentration of power in the hands of the wealthy. We need to get rid of the homophobia, the, the, the um, discrimination against LGBTQ persons, against you know all of that. And we need to end war. I mean, war, like I said, there's only one war that's worth fighting, the global class war. But we need to end war and we need to eliminate religious fascism, this idea that God is this authoritarian hierarch up in heaven who is just waiting to send everybody to an eternal hell if they don't believe 10 impossible things before breakfast. I don't like that kind of religion. That's the kind of religion I was raised with. I would rather invent a new kind of religion, which I call the communism of love. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say in the last few minutes here? So what are the things I'm up to? I am... Um, 
you'd rather do in person. I would agree that I believe in in person uh, is superior. I originally started this as a small group at the People's Church of Chicago, and we we stayed together for several months. But everyone in the group, there were people who moved, and people, you know, I I largely attract young adults because, you know, socialism these days is a thing for young adults. There there are very few of the elder socialists from the 60s. They're dying off in droves. I mean, Bell Hooks just died last week, and you know, they're they're the left wing in the United States is a new generation is, is stepping up. Um, <laughs> all right, carbon, we're, we're having a debate about carbon, uh, destroying the environment with carbon. There's no debate, the science is proven, the tornadoes prove it, the disasters in the Gulf of Mexico, it all, the climate is being destroyed by carbon. Yeah, burning coal to run Zoom, very likely. And that's what we need to We need to take back the power of the big tech companies and turn them green. All right. And you can't do that on a one-to-one -one basis. It needs to be, like I said, a global communist revolution. I want to talk a little bit about socialism itself. Um, I was, um, I originally called myself an anarcho-communism. I'm anarcho-communist. And when I was living in the commune that I described in, in the, in the, 80s and 90s. I moved there in 86 and moved out in 1995. Um, and while I was living with that commune, I called myself an anarcho-communist. Then I, be, I had a faith crisis. I stopped believing in certain um, beliefs that, you know, like the idea of hell. I couldn't believe in a God who would send everybody to hell who, who didn't believe those 10 impossible things in the Nicene Creed or whatever. I just don't believe in that kind of hell. Um, and although I do believe in a hell for the rich and they can get out if they learn their lesson, but that's a whole other story. I'm not going to talk at length about hell, but I want to talk about the socialist movement. So for me, growing up in the eighties and nineties and the early two thousands, raising my children and wanting to see capitalism fall, but not knowing, not having the first idea of how to bring capitalism down. So I ended up joining in 1994, I joined the Committees of Correspondence. And that was when I think I first became a socialist because at, up until then I would have called myself an anarcho-communist. And I became a socialist and I began to, you know, read various left-wing writers more seriously, trying to understand how did Marx say we could overthrow communism or sorry, capitalism? How could we overthrow capitalism? I wasn't sure, but I was learning. And, and not a lot was happening until 2010. And if you remember 2010, that was when Occupy Wall Street got started. And before that, what kicked off, at least for the United States point of view, was the 2008 Great Recession and the Arab Spring in 2010 is really what directly preceded the Occupy Wall Street movement. So we had the beginning of an anti-capitalist politics, a mass anti-capitalist politics in 2010. And then in 2016, we get Bernie Sanders running for president and the socialist movement begins to explode. Every socialist organization, I was at that time a member of the Socialist Party USA and the Democratic Socialists of America began to attract way more numbers. The Bernie Sanders campaign was the beginning for a lot of people of their socialist awakening. And then he ran again in 2020 and you know he lost both of those elections. And in the meantime, we got Trump, which I could go on and on about Trump. It should be pretty obvious that I can't stand the human. I think he was possibly the worst president in my lifetime, but I, I did live through Nixon so, and George Bush, the younger and the elder. So it's hard to pick which one was really the worst, but Trump was pretty bad. But be that as it may, the socialist movement after Bernie Sanders ran in 2020, I feel is foundered. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to recoup after the very likelihood that Bernie Sanders will never run for president again. Now they could invent some kind of geriatric rejuvenation drug and he could run again in 2024. Although if we, we have this promise that if Biden as president is running again, he won't. And Biden's already said he's running again. So I don't think that in 2024, we're gonna see a new rise in the socialist movement. 
So I don't know what to think about. I, it was really great, from my opinion, from 2008 until 2020, the socialist movement was on a growth curve. And now it feels like it's stalled. And what do I decide to do? I'm going to start a church. <laughs> Makes no sense to some people. But I'm basically at my 25 minutes. Yeah, get the money out of get the money out of everything. Abolish money. We need communism. All right. Um, if you need to I continue will, for a little bit longer, Reverend. Go ahead. I, I don't need to. I think I have spent my uh, load, as it were. Okay. All right, Justin, you got your hand up. Go ahead and fire away in the first question. Let's hopefully we can see you. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, do a mini announcement, if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, the LP Chicago is having our Christmas party tonight at Louie's Pub on North Avenue in Wicker Park. We're collecting donations for the Catholic Worker House uh, to, for, for Christmas. Um, so I have a two-pronged question. The first question is, do you believe that Christ is God incarnate as man? And my second prong question is, since I have to dip out of here basically after this question, would you like to uh, meet up for beers and have a Bible discussion sometime uh, to further elaborate on, on the things you discussed tonight? I, I'm willing to do it. Did you say you're with the Libertarian Party? I'm the executive director of the state party. Okay. And, but you did say the Catholic workers who, I will be honest, Dorothy Day was a big influence in that earlier period when I called myself an anarcho-communist. But anyway, I, I, I would probably be open to that. Um, we'll have to figure out how to exchange information. Um, you can send it to me in the chat. Sure. Did you catch my first question? Am I answering questions or am I waiting till they're all asked? No, no. You're, you're right. answering question questions answer. as they proceed. This is question and answer. I forget. You The, the rebuttal is later. Right. The rebuttal's <laughs> later. It's been a while. Like I said, the last time I did this was 2016. Um, was Jesus God? This is a thing I think about because what is God? Who is God? What do we mean by God? Usually... And I'm going to you're going to get me on a tangent here. Usually God is an invisible mind that is, you know, infinite galactic, multigalactic sized mind. Right. That's God. And I'm like. Every mind that I know is encased in a skull. And needs physical neurons to make it run. So I guess I don't know that I believe in an, in an infinite, invisible mind. But this universe has brought into being amazing humans and amazing animals and amazing earth. And, you know, we're discovering new planets around stars every day. This universe is divine. I'm a pantheist. The universe is my God. And so in a certain sense, I would say Jesus speaking in his time for the poor, for the oppressed, in his time, he was the voice of the universe reaching out to humanity and saying, we can do better. So literally in the way the Orthodox Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, I like those documents. I actually read them. I, I was a very committed Trinitarian Pentecostal for a long time. But I now think of more of that as metaphor and symbol. What Jesus was doing was saying, the universe itself, is generous. Look at how it feeds the birds of the air. Look at how it clothes the, the grass of the field so that they become lilies. The universe is taking care of its children. Why aren't we taking care of humans? Anyway, that's my uh, answer is, if you believe Jesus was God, great. Do you also believe he was a communist? Then maybe you don't understand who Jesus said himself, who he said he was. Okay, uh, Bob Matter, then Margaret Gillette, then Jan Lee. So, Bob, go ahead and answer. Ask your question. Okay, Charlie, um, what is your what is your fair share of what someone else has worked for? Ah, so I I believe in abolishing money. 
I believe in organizing production through workers' councils, through a workers' state that sets the productive capacity and says, we have this much productive capacity, here's what we produce, we need to produce enough food, enough housing, enough transportation, enough clothing, enough medicine and healthcare for everyone. And once we meet the basics, then we can work on the luxuries and extras. So until we get a global communist revolution, I don't own anybody else's fair share, but I will say this, every dollar that Jeff Bezos owns, he owns because he stole it from the people he employs. I mean, he forced, or at least his managers, forced people to work during the tornado and hundreds of them were killed. So don't, don't make me feel sorry for the rich man. Oh, the capitalists and the, com the communists are coming after my money. It's not your money, it's the working class's money. And it's owned collectively by the working class. And, and we are not, stealing Jeff Bozo's wealth from him, we are stealing it back for ourselves. Okay. Next um, question. <laughs> okay, Margaret, you got a question. Go ahead. Okay. Unmute, Margaret. How much do you think Karl Marx drew from Jesus, number one? And number two, what is your opinion of Francis, the Pope? How much can he do? Is he... Would he do more if he were not concerned about schism in the Catholic Church? All right. Um, I believe Karl Marx, well, Karl Marx, a lot of people don't know this, but as a religious communist, and I was trying to decide what I thought about Marx, I found out that he had written a poem about union with Christ when he was like 14 years old. So he was raised a Christian. Now, his father was a convert. His father was Jewish. He converted. So Marx, he raised his own children as Christian, and Marx was a Christian until he encountered this guy uh, named Feuerbach. And Feuerbach convinced Marx to become an atheist. And But Hegel, Hegel, Marx's favorite philosopher, Hegel, was a Christian. He talked about Jesus and God in his philosophy and the spirit all the time. So in my opinion, Marx was just carrying on the prophetic tradition of Judaism in a secularized form. And, you know, so I think Marx was what he said, an atheist and agnostic for most of his life, but he carried with him his Christian upbringing, his Jewish heritage and his solidarity with the poor, which is a very Christian characteristic. Um, so let's talk about Pope Francis. Um, so I am, I am, as I said, the Catholic worker was a very big impression on me when I was a younger man, and I did consider converting to Catholicism. The problem is, is I uh, came to believe in uh, LGBTQ equality. I came to believe the Bible was not literally true. I came to believe that um, the creeds were human reason trying to figure out something that's just a mystery and in, and in some ways inventing mystery. So I decided that I could not be a creedal Christian and I could go into what specific, there were some personal events in my life that had a lot to do with that, losing my orthodox beliefs. Um, so back to the Pope. You know, if it were up to me, there would be no papacy, but it's not up to me, right? I have to let the Catholic church do what it's doing, but and I love the liberation theologians and the Catholic workers with, um, with um, you know, their, their dedication to the poor, their dedication to an anti-war politics and so on. I love those people. And I am much more political animal than most of your Catholic workers. I believe in organizing a socialist communist revolution. I have, don't have an idea how to organize one. I have, like I said, I tried to be uh, a member of the Socialist Party here in Chicago, and my experience ended on a very difficult note. We basically disbanded the party under my leadership because we were split by multiple fractions and factions within the um, Socialist Party of Chicago. And I would love to maybe someday try to bring it back, but I, I have to decide if I have the bandwidth for that. So, um, the Pope. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm talking around the Pope. I mean, he has reaffirmed 
the Catholic Church's stance on homosexuality. He has reaffirmed the Catholic stance on contraception. And he is an advocate for the poor and the oppressed. So the man's, and he's an advocate for environmental, you know, changing the way, um, transforming our economy our, and moving away from industrialism. So I believe that, um, you know, Francis is, 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 he has a good heart. He is a bishop. He is a cardinal. He is now a pope. And that has got to corrupt you. <laughs> Sorry if you are a Catholic. But I believe that power corrupts. And I, I think that, you know, the Pope growing, going up in that system, which we know is corrupted. I mean, look at the whole scandals that went on um, with priests molesting children. And the church has just done a shitty job of handling all that. No human religious organization, not even the two that I am closely a member of, not any of them, have ever been perfect or sinless. I just, you know, humanity is not a sinless creature. We are flawed. And, you know, I'm glad that we have the Pope that we have because he's a hell of a sight better than Benedict um, and John Paul II. You know, I actually like John Paul I more than I like John Paul II, but he died really quick. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I, I wish Francis would get some spine and start you know, saying, yes, we'll ordain women. Yes, we'll let LGBTQ persons be full members and we won't shame them for their sin because they're not sinners. LGBTQ love is just like any other love. All right, end of my rant on Pope Francis. <laughs> okay, uh, Jeanne, you've got the next question. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, um, I want to ask uh, why... Did you choose the name um, communism for for the church you want to start? It's a loaded word. A lot of people have a negative view about it. Uh, what's your uh, distinction between socialism and communism? What's the rationale for you to choose the name communism instead of like like you said, people's church or something like? universal compassion, which might be more descriptive than a loaded word to describe church and may not be the, um, the, the kind of the um, name that will give you more um, attract, attraction to the church you want to build. Okay. Um... So as I said, I, I originally would have said I don't have a politics when I was like 18 or 17. In fact, if anything, I was probably slightly conservative when I was 17. I actually thought Ronald Reagan was a good idea. I learned pretty quickly he was a terrible idea, but that's that's the ancient history. When I, by the time I was 18 or 19, I hated Ronald Reagan. Um, and that was when I began to move to the left. And I initially you know, just said, I, I am a radical. I don't know what that means. I went and lived with a commune. I was against war. I was against poverty. And I lived with a commune. And so, um, and it was living communal. And it was while I was living communal, I was exposed to liberation theology. And there was a book called Communism in the Bible. And I read it. And he convinced me that that was the word for the kingdom of God, that in the 20. 20th and 21st century and in the 19th century, you, if you call it the kingdom of God, people would think you're talking about a monarchy in which a, a priest rules the world or something. And so we don't even, you know, I think the word kingdom of God that, that is supposedly what Jesus said. Now, I am a student of the Greek and the Greek, Jesus actually said, basileia ho oranos, which are words we don't even understand, right? Basileia basilica. If you know the word basilica, which is a word for a, for a cathedral, Basileia is a very similar word. And then Uranos is like Uranus, the god of the sky. So Uranos, Bas Jesus didn't talk about the kingdom of God. He talked about a regime of universal love. And I agree that my theology is a theology of universal love. Absolutely. Um, but the history of communism, and it goes back before Karl Marx, 
and and Karl Marx didn't invent the word communism. He took it over. He he actually expelled or helped expel one of the Christian communists, a fellow by the name of Wilhelm Wittling. Um, it's just that the word communism, and I was I called myself a socialist for many years, but it in 2010 and 2011, all of a sudden it became it became almost acceptable to be a socialist. We had, like I talked about, the emergence of a socialist movement. And I no longer had to, I no longer felt like the word socialism was powerful enough. The word communism was much more powerful. Now I realize, and I, I, I can't assume, um, you know, there is still a communist party ruling in China and Vietnam and Cuba. And I will say that I have critical solidarity with the people of those nations. And I would like for their government to itself and become more truly liberating to the poor. But, you know, the word communism does, I, I once read somewhere that you pick a word depending on the fights you wanna have with that word, right? And by calling myself a communist, I get questions about well, what about this and what about that? And I've said, the reason I'm a communist is I believe in abolishing capitalism and eliminating poverty forever. So communism is the word. And I understand communitarian, I'm not trying to appeal to a big audience. As I said, if I ever have a church of maybe a hundred people or less, I'll be happy. I am not trying to appeal to the masses. I am trying to inspire the poor to fight. And I believe that the word communism more than any other word over the past century and a half has been the banner of the working class radical movement has been communism or socialism, which they're similar words. But I, I, don't, I don't let bad people decide what a word means. I am a communist and you don't have to be a communist to be a part of my Church, you can say I'm a libertarian socialist. Somebody used that phrase. I used the phrase libertarian socialist for a while. Um, I have, I, I've come come further more towards Vladimir Lenin. I actually think Lenin was a great hero. He, how the Soviet Union ended up, in my opinion, isn't his fault. But I think that Lenin was one of the smartest human beings and one of the most passionate human beings. And therefore, my version of communism is what the um, word is. From each according to ability, to each according to need. That was how it's defined all the way back before Karl Marx. And then I say it's the communism of love because we don't want to just meet the physical material needs. I believe we want to have a relational society where people are happy and healthy and have healing of their traumas. Growing up in this authoritarian oligarchic society is traumatic for everyone and everybody I've ever met has some kind of mental illness. I have a mental illness. I have about five of them, okay? Because this society oppresses everyone. And so I do believe in the communism of love, but I don't want to run away from the word communism. I want a word that will provoke and make people think and even scare them a little bit. Because let me tell you, capitalism scares the fuck out of me. It is, it is going to destroy all life on earth if we let capitalism go on. We have to stop it. We have to stop it now. Okay, I'm done all with right. that. Question. All right, Justin, you got your hand up again, so go ahead. Um, how do you define capitalism? the way Marx did in Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1. Capitalism is a vast array of commodities that are produced by the workers. And they, the, the commodities come to have a power and a life of their own over the workers. So if you read it, it is a system of production. It is a system in which the wealthy own the means of production and they hire laborers to produce commodities that are then sold. Now, the commodities can be not physical, like, you know, 
CD, not CDs, but digital downloads. I mean, there are non, there are, you know, no, commodities that don't look well, like can do hand. But uh, at this point, Eliana, I'll let you go next. Capitalism is simply a system of profiting from the sale of commodities based on wage labor in a industrial production system of some kind. And it's where the bankers fund the corporations who then hire the workers, who then pay the workers only so much as they need to make them come back the next day in order to survive. And then the commodities go out and they're sold and the majority of the profits go to the owning class. That is how I define capitalism. Okay, uh, Ileana had indicated she did wanted a question. Yeah, so, uh, okay, thank you. And then I'll let Margaret thank you for the question. Can right. you hear me? Yes. Can we you can hear, hear me? You. Okay, yes, thank we you. can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Charlie, thank you so much for your speech. <laughs> Again, I didn't thought I will uh, participate. I'm just a good listener, you know. But I decided to ask you a question and applaud for your speech. Uh, okay. even, though, even though I'm not communist. <laughs> Maybe a little bit socialist, uh, start to learn more about it, but I really not communist. I don't know. Maybe I don't understand the real concept of communism, uh, you know, from the scientific point. So um, I'm from former Soviet Union. Okay. Okay. And I'm absolutely agree with you. And I can say again, I'm so agree with you. And again, I have to say, I'm agree with you, Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, we studied in school, and Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, we studied in school. Uh, and, you know, I'm so agree with you. They were genius, and they were smartest people, like at least, you know, uh, Vladimir Lenin uh, and uh, Karl Marx. I like them, you know, prospect about studying capitalism, uh, communism, and absolutely, <laughs> it's very, very cool. And actually, Lenin teaches us, you know what, what we learned from his impression? It was very famous impression. Okay, people in this planet Earth, let's study it, study it, and study it and let's learn, learn, learn. That's what he's, uh, you know, he's uh, actually Karl Marx didn't scream about it, but Lenin, he will, if you can see his speech on YouTube, and it's, it's absolutely brilliant because mm -hmm. he teaches us, Grandpa Lenin teaches us how to learn. learn. Right. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Is there, is there a specific question you have for me? Ah, question. No, I just, I don't want to okay. do rebuttal because this I can't understand. But, but okay. just uh, question is actually no questions. Just thank okay. you so much for your sure. presentation. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, Alana, okay. let's go. Uh, Margaret, you got your hand up, then we'll go with Justin again. Yeah. Whoever I, has I, a, okay, this, whoever hasn't had a question, I'll put on a priority, but go ahead, Margaret. Okay, two quick questions for you. Uh, the People's Church in Chicago, is that not the uh, UCC church of which Obama was a member and perhaps no. that's not his, that was not his church. He was, he was a member of Trinity. Okay. United Church of Christ. Oh. Okay. People's other, church is a United Church of Christ congregation, but they're very different. Okay. The other question I've got, there's a book, an excellent book, in my opinion, perhaps you've heard of it, Saving Jesus from the Church, written by <laughs> UCC minister in Oklahoma, and his thesis is basically, you don't have to believe the unbelievable to follow Jesus. Are you familiar with that book? Maybe. I I, I, I totally like that title, you know, that, that Christianity has really misunderstood Jesus, but, you know, but that's a, that's a, yeah, I, I haven't, I don't know anything specifically about that book. Okay, I just was curious. Sure, sure. Who is next? 
All right, Justin, you got your hand up again, so go ahead. And if anybody else has a question, let's get your hands up or just let me know. How would you reconcile, say, um, I mean, uh, Christ said to keep the commandments uh, when he was speaking to the, the, the prince and he listed them out. One of them was do not seal. And I want to, I'm, I'm curious, even, you know, how, how you may can reconcile that with, say, seizing the means mm-hmm. or wealth redistribution or, uh, or anything like that. So um, the passage that I quoted in Luke, in which said, that the wealthy will have will get nothing and the poor will get everything the hungry will get a feast and the gluttonous the 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 over the overfed rich class will be sent away empty and and starving and miserable jesus was not a voluntaristic um, messiah he was saying that a divine accounting is going to happen in human history. Now it hasn't happened yet, but I would say that various events in human history were moments of accounting, you know, when the poor rose up against the wealthy. Um, because, and, and, and early Christianity, you'll find this in a lot of the patristic fathers, particularly John Chrysostom, um, some of the others will say that and Jesus even said this, if you have two coats, give one away. If you have you know, enough food for yourself, share with your neighbor. And the implication is that having too much is stealing in and of itself. That if you have more wealth than your neighbors, you probably got it by defrauding someone in the process. And as a socialist, I believe that the wages that I make from my current employer, I do have a couple of jobs, Um, One of them I can tell you about, I'm an Uber driver. Um, The restaurant and the Uber makes more money than I do off of the work that I do. And I believe that um, that is because of the owning of the means of production. They're able to extract value from my labor that rightfully I would need to survive. And every week, every two weeks, I my paycheck is gone. My wife's paycheck is gone because it's expensive as hell to live in the city of Chicago. And I have to have a car for my job. And I'm always repairing my car and putting gas. It's expensive to live. And Jesus basically is clear. He does not think poverty is a sacred divine thing. He came to abolish poverty and, and abolish it on behalf of the poor. So when you take this commandment, do not steal, Jesus What did he say in the next, you know, interchange with this wealthy young person? He said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then follow me, join my movement. Um, Jesus believed that God and the people, and, and, you know, you know, when, when sometimes when a biblical passage says God, it's saying really the people of God will seize and bring about justice. And that's what. I believe is that the working poor of the earth are going to seize the wealth because it actually belonged to them in the first place. And it's they're unstealing it. Okay, uh, Raj, we're gonna. I'm gonna let uh, Charlie go. Then I'm gonna let you go because Charlie had his hand up. He's also a first question, and then we'll get to you. Then we'll go to Janice. Then we'll go back to Justin. Okay, Reverend Earp. Um. After the revolution comes, <laughs> has any thought been given to what do we do with individuals like Bob Matter or Tim Bulger who have been <laughs> brainwashed completely Good. into believing that they should work <laughs> to make the 1% uh, wealthier than they already are? Do you think maybe we should give them jobs in warehouses or something like like that for maybe 10 years or so? Um, 
I don't have the power to make a decision about that. But I do believe that um, the failure of capitalism is looming. I think the failure is ecological. The failure is political. The failure is economic. The declining rate of profit over the total history of capitalism should terrify the business class. They know that there's a time bomb ticking at the heart of their economic system that is going to make it impossible to continue. And the question is, is what did we replace it with? Capitalism has no future. And so people who you know, want to defend capitalism, I'm like, you're defending a dead system. It's going to die. No matter, you can believe that capitalism is the most wonderful rational economic system. It depends on frictionless free trade, which is bullshit. But anyway, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But capitalism is going to go belly up, I believe, in the next decade or two at most. And then we'll have to decide what to do. Okay, uh, I think I said, uh, Raj. Raj, Raj. Okay, Raj, please go ahead. Uh, Charlie, I have a, what you are talking about. Uh, I think uh, if you take out the religion as a, as a kind of a human, Thing general rather than Jesus thing or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, China, China has accomplished what you are talking about. They they have taken a communist thing, and uh, they have taken a capitalist youth, a huge capitalist, and make uh, several hundred million from China very poor to a comfortable middle class. And so that th that is what you are trying to do basically. Their poor people have better living condition and a better future. And China has accomplished that. So what do you think about China? Um, so China is, a, is a, an interesting case. Um, and and I, I am not a China expert. I do read various analyses of what's going on. You know that they recently um, punished some of their capital, because there's been an economic crisis. The Everance, is that right? Everance has had an economic crisis, which is one of their wealthiest companies, had a lot of foreign investment in it, and now it's hemorrhaging money. And the, the Chinese government cracked down, unlike Wall Street, right? When Wall right. Street went belly up in 2008, the government gave them new money. to, <laughs> And in China said, hell no, we're putting these people away. Um, I'm proud. I'm glad they did that. Now, do I think China is actually bringing the world closer to communism? They are lifting a lot of people out of poverty, but there's some question about how good a job they're doing. And I, I don't know enough to say they're, they've found the solution. Communi China is one of the largest nations on earth. And so it is significant that they have a party that has roots in the, you know, the revolution of Mao Zedong and his founding party, but there is also a belief that the party betrayed Mao, you know, at, towards the end of his life, which is why he kicked off the Cultural Revolution, which, you know, had its good and bad sides. Um, I'm not an expert on China. Um, and, and I believe, you know, I believe that anybody can, can try to do a better job. And I think the Communist Party of China could do a better job being truly communist, but they're not there yet. But um, I think the same thing about Cuba, Venezuela, any of these putative socialist countries can do a better job because we're not there. There's so much poverty. There's so much suffering around the world. And the real thing is this global climate change, China has been fostering climate change because they're expanding their use of fossil fuels. And we need to stop that on a global scale. Charlie, I'm I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me for disturbing. You know, I want to I want to stick magically yeah. to your main points. Okay, yeah. it, it, it poverty and suffering people. Okay, right. from just that point of view, mm -hmm. you know, distributing income to poor people, uplifting poor rather right. than rich. They have uplifted rich people too, but poor people. On that particular point, have they yeah. done a good job? And the question is, do we have anything to learn from it? from them. Yes, we have we should learn from everybody who is trying to improve the lot of the poor. Absolutely. Um, I again I'm not I am not a expert on what has been done. I know that they claim that and, and statistics seem to bear it out that they have lifted more people out of poverty 
in the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years than any other country on earth. And they may very well completely eliminate the worst kinds of poverty within their borders. Um, and that would be great. It's still not socialism, it's still not communism, but it would be an improvement over what we have if we could do that on a global scale. That's all I wanna insist. I, I don't like to get into debates about China because I'm not an expert and because people get really entrenched in their particular position and I, that's just not something I wanna fight about. Um, I, you know, I wasn't around when Mao was in power. I was a kid. I don't remember very much other than, you know, Richard Nixon going to China. That was like, <laughs> I remember that. But other than that, I don't really remember much about that time of, of life. And so I'm glad that they are reducing poverty. Um, but I'm also concerned that they crack down on civil liberties. I mean, they've had some, there was some law passed about effeminate men in China. That bothers me. Um, there again, their fossil fuel consumptions are off the charts, but the, so is the United States. I mean, the U.S. military is the world's largest polluter. We need to take, you know, eliminate fossil fuels. The world, saving the world is more than just lifting people, poor people out of poverty. We should be doing that, but it is also getting a handle on industrial destruction of the environment. And I don't know any major nation that's doing a great job on that. And I agree, China has lifted a lot of people out of poverty. The question is, is whether that, um, what, at what costs they're doing it and, and are they, is it something that can be done worldwide? And I, I just don't know. And, but absolutely, if you're lifting people out of poverty, I'm 100%, that's a great thing to do. Okay, uh, Janice, go ahead. Unmute Janice, we're ready to go. Oh, oh you're I'm no, sure you, you got your hand. Uh, oh, I'm up. Okay. You're up, Janice. <laughs> I have some I have some simple okay, I have some simple questions. Um uh, uh Reverend Charlie, um, yeah. does your church meet at the People's Church? No. Um I am a member of the People's Church and I donate and I used to be actively involved, but when you go to seminary you kind of have to separate from the church you're a member of. That's just kind of an ex expectation. Unless I take a job there, which I have not taken a job there. So I, I used to I used to have a group that met there, but that group came to an end. Um, my online church is online. I When I go back to having some kind of in-person events, I'm not sure what they'll be or where. Um, I have a few people who locally who are helping me organize, my son, my daughter, I have some friends who are supportive of the project, um, but we haven't figured out yet because right now COVID is still making in-person <laughs> gathering such a questionable thing to do that I'm not ready to do that until, you know, until things get a little bit better. Um, and it, I don't think I'll do it at the People's Church, but because uh, I have done a lot of things with them over the years. But right now, that's not that's not the plan. Um, but I haven't yet. Um, I, I asked. Uh, I asked because I had read in the paper that the People's Church closed. I remember going there in 2012 when NATO was supposed to come to Chicago, yeah. and I went downtown to protest that and then NATO ended up at uh, Camp David instead because of all the protests that were planned uh, regarding mm -hmm. NATO and so I went to the people's church where there was a non-NATO event and that's when I became connected to Code Pink um, yeah. because they were there. So the people's church is fairly small. I'm friends with the pastor. He is a colleague. Um, uh, he is a, I, I'm not sure, he is a Unitarian Universalist minister, and he's also has some kind of United Church of Christ affiliation, because it's both. The People's Church is both. Um, and I, you know, they ordained me in July. They were, two churches ordained me. The Unitarian Church of Quincy, Illinois, and the People's Church of Chicago co-ordained me on Zoom, um, because that's the way things are done now. <laughs> anyway, um, they are in the process of trying to sell their building to, to some organization. And they've had a few 
offers. The offers weren't quite what the board could approve. So they're still in the, in the process of figuring out how to sell that building. So the answer is they are not planning to close as a congregation, but they are planning to sell the building. Okay, uh, I guess uh, Justin's next again. So go it's ahead. It's a great Justin. building. It is. I love it. I wish it. I wish there was a way to keep it. <laughs> okay, we'll have Justin and then Jeanne. Go ahead, guys. Justin, if you're so, on. your definition of capitalism, or which is Marx, is definitely different from say how like me or Tim or maybe Ken uh, would define capitalism. Do you think that there's and I'm sure if we got down to it, we'd, we'd, we'd find a lot of the same symptoms of things wrong with society uh, and want, definitely want to improve things. Do you think that some of this semantic sort of stuff gets in the way of uh, unity? Uh, people can come together all, all, all over the place and, and work for real unity and, and positive change? Yeah, I, I'm not working for unity. I'm working for class war. Um, and I know that sounds pretty bad because I'm, in the U.S. we don't like class war. But the reason we don't like class war in the U.S. is because it scares the capitalist class. Um, I am for the victory of the working class, the poor and the oppressed against those who are oppressing them with their wealth and their political power and their military might. And I want... The, the, those things, the, the, the capitalist wealth producing system, however you define it, to be torn apart and replaced with a system that lifts everybody out of poverty and throws a few people into poverty like Elon Musk and the wealthiest capitalists, they need to experience poverty to figure out why they should never have made their workers so poor. Um, will libertarians be put against the wall? I am not a violent person. I don't own a gun. I don't plan to own a gun. Um, I, I don't know what will happen when this global class revolution against the capitalist oligarchy, the, the political, the military elites, when this war really gets going. And actually, it won't get going until those systems are so weak that they can't fight back. Right now, it's stupid to have an armed rebellion in the United States because you know what will happen? You'll get mowed down by the military and the police and the National Guard. So I have no arms training. I was a pacifist for a long, long, long time, and I've never fired a weapon. I've never, yeah, so, but, but, you know, I personally believe that the Civil War was a good thing, and I personally believe that destroying the fascists in World War II was a good thing. And, you know, so I'm not anti-war. I was for a very long time, but I have since come around to saying that in special, very rare cases, war is necessary. And I believe, you know, for example, the war in which the Bolsheviks overthrew the provisional government, which had overthrown the czar, that was a necessary military conflict. Um, and then what happened is, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union, the Russian, this communist Russian government came under siege from like 14 different European and United States. And we know how that went. It did not go well because you had a tiny little group of Bolsheviks who didn't have a lot of political power, but they had some and they were able to barely withstand and hang on as this little beleaguered country. Should we put libertarians execute them in mass? I don't think so. I will say I don't think so. But again, that will not be a decision that will probably be made in my lifetime. Because for me, the, the global anti-capitalist revolution is really only possible when capitalism reaches a critical crisis. And it's coming. Like I said, capitalism is on its deathbed. It will, the economic system, the banking system, it will all collapse because there's no longer going to be a profit in exploiting human beings. And when that happens, only then can the poor and the oppressed rise up, unite themselves and create something different. I don't think mass executions are necessary, but 
some military fighting will be necessary to seize control of the situation. And I'm not a military strategist. I can't outline how it should work. Jeanne, you had your hand up. Go ahead and go next. OK. Um, uh, just a follow-up qu question um, about the, so the uh, inequality in, um, is widening. And when you have a large number of um, poor people, um, it's likely to generate social unrest. Um, and your um, vision of um, equality for, for all, um, you have mentioned about um, how, how to achieve it, but I think it's very vague. Um, so the question is, uh, do you think a revolution or evolution is preferable uh, in achieving the equity between um, haves and have-nots? Or uh, if you have, uh, <laughs> if you have way, what's your preferred way of achieving the uh, equity uh, among all the people? Right. So I use I use the term revolution, um, but I also know because I've studied revolutions. I studied the Bolshevik Revolution. I've studied the Ch revolution in China, and I know that just because you seize power, it doesn't mean the next day everything turns out all rosy. Right? You still have a lot of work to do. Um, so, yes, I believe there will have to be seizures of power on a global scale. And we've never done this. There's not, you know, the United Nations is not a world government. And if we're going to eliminate climate catastrophe, we need a global way of organizing all of the nations of the earth and all the peoples of the earth to agree to stop burning fossil fuels and to create new eco-friendly ways of carrying out our business and our lives. And so that requires a global solution. And I would say that same global um, economics so that no one is poor and no one is rich. We're all sharing in the wealth that we are creating and it needs to be wealth that replenishes the earth instead of extracts and subtracts from the earth's bounty. I am not smart enough. I mean, and I, I, I don't have a system or a plan. What I believe is, is more in the negation. There should be no poverty. There should be no ecocide, no destruction of the atmosphere, no destruction of ecosystems, no extinction of animal species. I'm mainly about the negatives. I, I am for a planet that is ecologically harmonious and balanced. I am for a, a level of abundance that is sustainable for every living creature, human and non-human. I want a level of abundance. How we get there is gonna be a generational long struggle. In the meantime, yes, we need to seize power when the opportunity arises for a successful seizure of power. Um, you know, it, it, I think the Russian revolution, the Bolshevik of 1917 had very positive effects for the people in Russia after, you know, the czar was already gone, but the, um, the, the government that replaced the czar continued to fight World War I, which was the stupidest thing they could have done. And that's why the Bolsheviks stepped in and said, yeah, we're gonna pull out of this war because it's a losing war. And that, that alone was worth the Bolshevik revolution. And there were other things that the Bolsheviks put in place that were positive. But again, overnight, you're not going to undo all the damage that has been going on for the centuries that, that Western industrial capitalism has been built up over the past three centuries or so. This, you're just not gonna, and all the colonialism that's been done you know, in Africa and Latin America, you're not gonna undo all the bad things overnight, but revolutions I think are a necessary part of this process of liberating the planet earth, every living species on planet Earth. Okay, uh, Margaret, you got the next question, then Raj, and then Bob. Okay, I this is a little off topic, but I'd like your opinion. Sure. 
uh, regarding the immediate future of the United States, mm -hmm. all of these attempts to suppress the vote, right. our rights, et cetera, et cetera. What do you foresee rather immediately, say in the next two to eight years for the United States? <laughs> I wish I could say I was optimistic. Um, now, I think Bernie Sanders was too conservative. And that was, if you go back to, I, I appeared at the College of Complexes in 2016 and made that case that he was essentially too conservative. But in my opinion, he had inspired a younger generation of activists to begin opening these questions of what is a socialism, what is possible in the United States. And so I believe it's the younger generation, not oldsters like Bernie or me. Um, so what's going to happen in the next two years? I think Biden is probably going to run again. I think in the midterms, the Republican right is going to fight, fight, fight to try to nail down and intensify their offensive. Because right now, the ruling class hates the masses of American people. And they, you know, Donald Trump was only the public face of that seething hatred. And I don't see it ending in two years in the midterm elections. We, we might see the Democrats get a majority, but I think the odds are they won't. And then in 2024, I think Biden already said he's running again. I think there's a good chance he could lose. <laughs> and he might lose to Trump because nobody's been able to make an illegal charge stick against Trump, even though he's done millions of illegal things. Nobody can seem to put the guy in jail, so he's going to get chances of running. I don't know if he will. Maybe there'll be some other Republican run. Some of those Republicans are worse than Trump. Some of the guys that Trump beat in 2016 were worse than him. He just was a loud mouth, was popular. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not optimistic for the next couple of years. And I also believe that we're going to start seeing, I mean, the tornadoes that happened this month are terrifying. The wildfires that continue to happen is terrifying. Um, the, the oceans and the die-offs and the toxic stuff that's in the oceans, and of course, the poor. People are dying of COVID when they shouldn't die of COVID. People are dying of curable diseases because they have no, it's my microphone, Tim? Yes. I'm gonna get closer to my, I'm using, I'm doing this on my phone. So it's all along, it's been hard to hear me? No, it's but just recently, it uh, it just recent that uh, you, you kind of went from a deep sound to tinny sound. Just in the last two minutes. He's coming along. All right. Uh, Reverend Charlie Earp is going to probably be joining us in a minute. It, 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 is it blue? Is the Bluetooth phone to the it die? It's uh, Melissa asked us. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? Is that, did that improve anything? What yes, it does. It's improvement a little bit. Okay. I turned off. No, my Mike, phone. it's not on your end. I turned off the Wi Fi. I was on Wi-Fi on my smartphone. I turned off the Wi-Fi, and now I'm only relying on T-Mobile, <laughs> which sometimes is better than my Wi-Fi because I have AT&T for Wi-Fi. Anyway, it's sorry still about still not coming through. I'm not coming through now. It's not coming terribly through, but well. do you have a way? Okay, uh, just just uh, turn your Wi-Fi back on. I think it may be. Do you have power to your phone? Yeah, I have plenty of power to my phone. Now we can hear you now. Okay, we can hear you now. Go ahead and speak again. Okay, and I lost track of where I'm at. Um, we can hear you fine now, Charlie. But your internet connection's bouncing, so we'll have to get you back. That's AT and T for you. <laughs> uh, he'll he'll be joining us again in a minute. Um, Horrible. I I think the empire, the oligarchy, is struggling. To make, to make, make the world. I don't know. We're, I'm not optimistic. I, like I said, if I was more skilled at organizing, I'd start a political party. But I'm not. I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher's kid. I know religion. I don't really know how to organize a party or a movement. But there are people out there who don't know how to organize movements and who do know how to organize politically. I hope they figure out something, and we don't have the horrible nightmare that I could see coming. Okay. Uh, 
Raj, you're next. Yes. Uh, Charlie, we talked about economics. Now let, let's go to religion. You're talking about Jesus. Uh -huh. and, uh, and my feeling about Jesus is that uh, he was very shrewd, Jesus or Peter. Somebody was very shrewd, very capitalist, very strategic. They succeeded other fail because they knew how to raise money. Peter and uh, Jesus did very good hiring that accountant guy and scares the hell out of the rich people. And they were always going to rich people for money and rich people financed them. And, uh, and uh, that's what they succeeded. So, so it, that it, it is clear that, that uh, Jesus wasn't for a poor people. And on other case, I can make for the same thing. Uh, when it came to a employee's wages, and uh, there is Bible, Bible there, are, there are some passages on that. And uh, Jesus says that uh, they should be paid sustainable wages. That means uh, basically you got enough food and place so that you can come to work next day. He wasn't very easy, same as a capitalist later on to do in a, in a early capitalism, early manufacturing. And so Jesus, Jesus uh, I do not see him a very, very poor oriented. Even uh, the James once went to Jesus and uh, Jesus and James are talking and Jesus said, why, why, why the kids are not praying, right? They are that kind of a, you know, sleepy and not paying attention. And James says, James says that, uh, well, they haven't had their morning food. And how do you expect hungry, hungry people to keep attention on hungry kids and to pray? And uh, Jesus walked away, didn't say anything. So, so I, I mean, I mean, this connection between Jesus and uh, poor, it misplaced. What do you say? No, I think you're absolutely wrong. I don't know where you're getting your facts from. Um, Bible. You're no, you're not. You're 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 reading. You're 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 putting forward an interpretation that almost every scholar I know would disagree with. Every scholar I've ever read would say that Jesus, the heart of Jesus's teachings, was about the liberation of the poor. Now there are there are capitalist Bible scholars who want you to believe that Jesus was a capitalist, but he wasn't. He said that. If you follow me, you must give up every possession you own if you, to follow him. He said that. And when, what happened on the day of Pentecost when the church was founded? They shared all their wealth. They set up an Occupy commune in Jerusalem next to the temple to, where all the poor were fed every day. That's based on the, the, the book of Acts. Jesus was opposed to poverty. He was opposed to the ruling class. He was opposed to the Roman Empire. He said they should be sent away empty. And anyway, I yeah. have no argument for you because you don't base your, your interpretation on actual careful reading of the Bible. So I, I'm not going to deal with this concept. Uh, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you one thing. Okay, okay, I, you are not. But you are you trying to connect. You unimpressed me. You, you have said 14 different lies about Jesus. I, I'm not interested in you. Okay cancel culture but let's go bob you're next <laughs> no okay, it's not uh, wasting time with somebody who's making a foolish argument yeah uh charlie uh, have you have you noticed uh, the um the common thread that seems to run that uh through all poor people and that is that uh that it seems to be a a uh shortcoming in their iq uh it seems that uh it seems like wealth is sorted in this country more or less by IQ and uh, you know, pro productivity. That's bullshit. I mean, that, that's uh, every uh, every study or, uh, you know, that's every indication that is, that, that is true. That is capitalist misuse of data. It is a lie. I have looked into it. People aren't poor because they're ignorant. They're poor because they're deprived of an education, which is not the same thing. It's not innate intelligence that causes poverty. It's depriving people of an education. 
And I'm well, done with that question too. I don't suffer fools after a point. And I'm getting a little pissed <laughs> off with this conversation. Well, also on that same line, what, uh, what about what about what about the uh, well, what about the thread through criminality? There's also a a, a, a correlation there as well. I you know I, I'm gonna I've already been accused of cancel culture on here. I'm, I'm you guys can continue to argue amongst yourselves. I'm done tonight. Sure, I'm Reverend, really stick done. around. And I will stick never around. come back to the College of Complexes. Stick this around, is, Reverend, please. I was being facetious, so please stick around. I am sorry. Yeah, there's no personal attack yeah, allowed at the college. I apologize, Reverend. And then certainly not from the chair. Why don't yeah, we, you're right. uh, why don't I, we go I to admit I'm sorry we about that, enough, Reverend. Uh, questions. We're getting a little test here. Everybody calm down. Let's all uh, agree to disagree. Okay. Why don't, yeah. we, why don't we start the rebuttals and I'm going to go off yeah. there when it happens. Okay, we'll start the rebuttals then. I know there's a lot of people in here and uh, Reverend, thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate your, 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 your certainly your, your things. All right, who has a rebuttal? Please raise your hand or let me know. Raj. Charlie's got one. Um, I have Raj got one. one. All right, hang on here. Let me uh, let me get a let me get a piece of paper. So Charlie and Raj. Who else? I know I'm going to do one tonight. So that's three. Uh, who else is going to do a rebuttal tonight? Okay, Bob. Uh, okay, so we have Charlie, we have Raj, we have Tim, we have Bob. And uh, who else is going to do a rebuttal? I will keep it open until we're we're ready. So who wants to go first? Um, Raj, would you let, like let Charlie go? Charlie go. Charlie, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Why not? All right, I'm going to make it uh, roughly maybe six six to seven minutes. No, I, uh, no, we don't need that long. Five. All right, five. let's let's go. Uh, all, all right, right first sure. of all, let's thank our speaker for uh, a wonderful presentation. And I believe you did an excellent job yielding all the questions. And thank you for your efforts uh, towards uh, eliminating poverty and bringing about some progressive social change. I'll be collecting here on a, a few things. I'm a hard sell. I'm, I've listened to a lot of guys over the years. And I must admit, this is one speaker that I agree with uh, 100%. Everything he said was right on the money. And you guys are trying to take your shots at him, but he don't seem to be working here. Okay, the next thing is, I live about a block and a half away from the headquarters of the Communist Party of the United States. And over the years, I've been to many, many events at the headquarters. And one thing I inside I wanted to give to some of you people is that is that in the party, and I just was at a, a Zoom conference call. They have a labor committee, uh, labor organizers committee nationwide call on Thursday. I was just thinking that over all the years, that I've been attending events. I even took courses and classes. And the thing is, we never, I've never heard serious discussion of doctrine, specifically, oh, the depth of Marxism and oh, Lenin and this party and that faction and this. And the other thing is, there's not a great deal of discussion, amazingly enough, of China, Russia, Cuba, and all Korea, and all that. They basically are talking about leftist, leftist politics, problems confronting our society. And you, if you've got some notion that uh, the communists sit around and debate endlessly some, some doctrine, you are couldn't be more wrong. It's basically a, a, a progressive organization and progressive-minded people. Uh, they focus more on the issues as well as it should be. Um, 
You also mentioned you were in the committees of correspondence. I haven't heard about them for a number of years. I know they've been around, but I attended the founding convention of the committees of correspondence. It was one effort to precipitate change within the United States. Um, and finally, last of all, um, one thing I have learned, and it's an incontrovertible truth, that labor creates all wealth. Now, unfortunately, we have a system where the 1% do little or no labor and seem to have accrued all the wealth. Now, anybody who finds that acceptable to me is in a state of denial. Uh, this should not continue. It is inequitable. It is unfair. My friend, George is People work hard. Very difficult. People work in the United States more so than if, if you want figures, Bob Matter. People in the United States probably work harder than anybody else on earth. And the guy was entirely correct when there should be no poverty whatsoever in the United States anywhere. And there certainly is a lot of it. People are living fragilely one week or one layoff or illness away from total bankruptcy. That should not be the case. There is no economic security whatsoever under the current system. And until it does, I see no value in supporting a system that can't even guarantee minimal economic security. Anyhow, thanks, Charlie. Come again. Okay, I'm going to go next. Okay. Because I have a feeling that all you guys are definitely wrong about the capitalist system. I'm going to talk about the moral superiority of the next time I hear someone dusting off the same old prescriptions that have been tried and tested and found wanting again and again. The first and most basic freedom of capitalism is the freedom to make choices. Capitalism promotes choice. It promotes the ability to people to decide what they want to buy, how much they want to buy, where they want to live, and where they want to lurk, and so on. With statism, choices are limited. The government decides, for example, what kind of light bulb is available, how much toilet paper you can use, and the minimum factory efficiency of an air conditioner, and more. The removal of simple choices reduces freedom. The removal of all choices is slavery. You're just the reading of to us, man. Is towards Some slavery. propaganda you're reading to us. And uh, Charlie, guess what? Capitalism also promotes cooperation. And you know why it promotes cooperation? Because there's something called a price. You got to agree upon a price and you do it. If you get if you get a lot of money for something, you produce it. If you don't get a lot, you won't produce it. The thing is, is that the price signals are one of the best ways to promote what people want and what they don't want. If you don't like what a corporation is doing, you don't have to patronize it. If you like what they're doing, you get you can patronize it. The thing is that statism denies cooperation and all this stuff about how you're going to distribute the food and all this stuff under a central planning system has not simply worked. We've seen it work. We've seen it tried before. The collective farming of the Soviet Union, which caused the biggest famine in a, in a while, uh, and many other things. Now, I'm not saying, and capitalism is much more optimistic. We live in a world of opportunity. We constantly survey the landscape looking for possibilities to gain, to build, or expand, or to create. And I'll tell you, status, on the other hand, focus on scarcity. They see a world of limited resources, which gives them reason to ration and allocate. And the thing is, capitalism also believes in people. The pe what are you reading to us? Charlie, Martin you know, Turtle? I'll tell you what. Yeah, you I can't think, even I say, think, can't I think, even Charlie, talk. because I believe in this stuff. You don't even, you believe you don't even, can't talk about it. I'm going to talk it about it. Like Charlie, shut up. Let me get my five minutes in. You know, capitalism also believes in people and it promotes equality. 
You know why I believe in people and capitalism? Because it's been the best way. If you look at a book called uh, The Mystery of Capital and you really get to learn about it, you know, you believe that capitalism is the best way to make wealth, get wealth, uh, let pe put people to work and do all kinds of other things. And I believe it promotes equality too, because not income inequality, it's the cry of the statist. And to believe it or not, you need these rich guys to make jobs and to bring innovation in. We wouldn't have had our electrical system. We wouldn't have had our uh, money of our re reliable benefits without the, without Thomas Edison and Industrial Laboratory, without GE, without some of these larger corporations taking the millions of dollars that 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 they could get off of Wall Street and make to make money doing this stuff. We wouldn't have had our transcontinental railroad without the uh, instruments of modern finance. And the thing is, you know, one of the biggest about things- these guys have built it. Charlie, you know, one of the biggest things is that uh, capitalism has promoted more people out of poverty in the last 300 years than any other system I know. And if you just look at the world the way it is, when, you know, when you go into these countries that proclaim themselves as communist, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, South North Korea, the Soviet Union, China. Yes, they all are uh, supposedly communist. They all, but the one thing they do lack is freedom. They don't have, uh, they don't have the way to make freedom to make choice. They don't have the freedom to do anything else. And the point of the matter is, I believe that, um, I firmly believe that there that we don't need more cap that we don't need to abolish the capitalist system. What we need is much, much more, much less of a barrier to entry for poor people to start a business, much less of a poor people to do anything else. Now, I may not be popular amongst this group of lefties, but I'll tell you something else. Um, when we take a look at capitalism and the benefits it's produced, and it's gotten most of the world out of poverty, the reason why we've seen all this stuff in the last 20 years out of the, the, the reduction of overall poverty around the world is because our capitalistic system is working. You know, and the thing is, we might uh, have a little envy now for some of the status systems, but, but people don't like living under them. They want to come here to the United States where we have generally free markets and free opportunity and freedom. They don't want to go to your communist utopias like the Soviet Union or China. We all know that those countries don't don't have the amount of political freedom we do. As a matter of fact, I don't think we could have the, this forum in those two countries. Now, they want the freedom of a sweatshop? Charlie, you know, the one thing you got to understand is this. Your sweatshop... The freedom of a sweatshop in Asia. Well, Charlie, guess what? That's certainly a hell of a lot better than the peasants on the farm. You know, they people go to those places because they can make their lives better. And the sweatshop, as you talk about, usually within a, a generation is gone. Look at Singapore, for example. Just look at some of these countries that have really embraced the uh, free market system. They are now wealth. And the thing is, what happens now today with wealth is that it can be achieved almost overnight, especially with the development of the Internet. And we wouldn't have our, you know, we did some government research and all that stuff, but we wouldn't have today's internet without him. The like number of swift crossing. traps have, has increased, not decreased. Oh, Charlie, give me a break. You know darn well that uh, more people are out of poverty now than there were even 20 years ago. And I mean, if you don't believe me, go look at a site called humanprogress.org. You know, you guys who are of, of, of a left persuasion, I'm sorry, I just don't think you get it. I really just don't think you get it. Oh, um, I'm done with my rebuttal. Melissa, if you got something to say, please go ahead and say it. I've got my off my soapbox. Uh, please unmute if you got something to say, and uh, I'll be more than happy to let you go. All right. Um, hey, my name is and that, that's a lot to rebut, but... Um, Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to hear you, please. Well, yeah, I first of all, the talk about capitalism bringing people out of poverty, like a lot of that's because they changed the definition of poverty. They changed the dollar amount, what was considered poor, which kind of automatically shifted the amount of people in poverty. But... Uh, 
No, and then also, none of these countries with communist ruling parties claim to be communist. They're all socialists. They all call themselves socialists. China calls itself socialist with Chinese uh, characteristics. Um, and they're all different. They, they all have leveling uh, different levels of like uh, freedoms and you know, different, different systems. And, you know, some have, you know, one party, some have a few parties and they all have elections, whether those elections are fair is, you know, another question, but they do have elections, all of them. Now, some you would say like, probably do a better job of, uh, because all of these countries have a sort of Congress or a parliament and they elect their local leaders. Now, are those leaders, are the candidates chosen by the party? Depends on the country, depends, you know. But I mean, besides that, talking about capitalism, especially when you mentioned the internet, the internet, <laughs> was a project, uh, a university project. And it also involved funding from the military. Yep. So it's, it's not like, it's not like it was like major corporations, like funding the internet, designing the internet. It was universities, the military, and, and also the railroads. That was definitely um, had government funding. Like, and you have to recognize that when major projects like this, especially the highway system, the highway system was 100% government funded. <laughs> but the railroads, so in order for you know any of these railroad companies to build railroads, they had to get the land from the government. <laughs> So again, like the railroads wouldn't exist without the government ceding the land to these com companies. And then, so you'd say like all of this wealth was created by these like in industrialists, like with their great ideas and they in employ people and, and they're so smart. But if you, None of these things would be possible without the much greater amount of people who actually make these things. And like, especially if you're talking about people like Elon Musk, maybe they have an idea, but oftentimes they're not even the one designing these products. You know, they're like, especially we talk about jobs like yeah, when when he started out, he built computers. And of course, he wasn't the only one. He worked with uh, his partner. But as, you know, Apple progressed into a large corporation, did he come up with product ideas? Sure. Who was actually designing those? Teams of people. Mm -hmm. And... And back to what the other person mentioned, when you're talking about intelligence, when you're talking about crime, does it make more sense to say that, oh, because these people were poor, they were unintelligent, or because these, pe like, because these people were born with a low IQ, that caused them to, um, to be poor? Or because these people were born with some kind of innate criminal element that they did crimes? Or could it be being born into an environment where they didn't, they had crumbling schools, crumbling infrastructure, and parents who were working several jobs so they couldn't spend time with them? M many uh, studies have shown that that when it comes to IQ, 
environment is the biggest factor. And also in terms of the test itself, I mean, it was created for like what French kindergartners to make sure that they were in the right like track. It like it, it's very narrowly focused on like Western culture and it doesn't really test like all kinds of intelligence. But I think that's the end. Well, Melissa, thank you for your points, by the way. I appreciate you contributing, okay? And in a lot of ways, I'm going to have to agree with you, too, on that stuff. I kind of went on a radical bent here, but uh, I appreciate you perking up and talking. And thank you very, very much for contributing to this forum tonight, okay? I didn't mean it so outrageous, but, uh, you know, thank you very much for cooperating. Okay, we still have... Raj, Raj goes now. All right, Raj, go ahead, and you got five minutes. Uh, uh, if you want to get on the list, I'll put you on the list for rebuttals. Uh, okay, Charlie, Charles, the, the speaker. I mean, uh, see, I thought you were doing so many good things, and you were talking about, and then there comes your faith mindset, righteous. And when you become righteous, it's all over. It's a one guy's word, one guy's word, it could a second guy's, third guy's, fourth guy's, fifth guy's, and there is, there is no solution. So you do not, you do not want to listen and say, hey, you are saying it's a garbage. I can say to everybody like that. And just, just like we had a fight between two guys. Okay, one, one says you are wrong, you are wrong. That, that is nothing happening. And, and uh, let, let, let me tell you something. The, the how to make a progress. You're not talking about how to create a power, eliminate a poverty. You're not talking about how to create a better world. You're not talking about how to create a happiness among people. You're talking about you're doing a solution. Oh, wow, this is the way, this is the way. And just that it's not working. The, the lady before us say, Melissa said just now that uh, person doesn't have education. If person you cannot get educated, like lots of in a black neighborhood, that means they're dumb. And they have the opportunity, and they get 25, 27, 30 year old, they don't have no education, and they don't have education, they don't have experience, and then they are doomed. You know, and so, so, so there are lots of things. And the, the, the why faith is not working. New York Times had an article and there are lots of comments. I sent some of comments on my email. And it is that the church has gone bad. And you are not improving anything. You know, Jesus says love. Love is the first thing. Love everybody. Okay, that, that is the first commandment. And, and, and nobody talking, we never talked about a love. We not, no, never talked about forgive. You never, never talk about be compassionate. Be caring, okay. Even the boy, your opponent, you be nice to him. You know, you, you capitalist, you be nice to him if you want to be a communist. See? And and of course, communist has contributed, capitalist has contributed, communist has contributed lots of things. Karl Marx idea, okay, has ultimately come to a labor movement, and le, le, the condition of the working people has improved over the ages. It was very, very bad. We know that. And there is no doubt about, in my mind, that uh, if others with that age good, Karl Marx has contributed as much also. And ideas evolve. And, and we have different ideas. In America, we can do, we can spread the idea, it works better. But to say, say for team that, that the communist in other country hasn't worked, okay? I mean, uh, China had done tremendous success story. And I do not say the Chinese people are any, any, any less smarter than American people or less educated or they are, they, are, they are less, don't know how to run capitalism. They do not know how to do capitalism. They, they know how to run cap better capitalism and better communism. And, and we see the results. America, we have a problem. We hate fear. You know, America's freedom is not absolute. Gates don't have freedom. The women's right to reproductive freedom is not there, it's injured, okay? So, so it's not that it's not that our freedom is absolute. Our freedom is substantially trouble. Blacks do not have a freedom. Okay, Latino do not, poor people do not have a freedom. So let, let, let's not carry out that, wow, you know, that we got it. We did not get it. 
we have problems. But our kind of wealth, for our kind of poverty, it's bloody same. Okay. For the amount of wealth we have, we are not able to manage it. Our capitalism is not managed able to manage COVID. Why other countries are able to manage some Europeans and we are not able to manage. And this is the same. So we cannot say that we have all the answers. And uh, it is very, look what, what, what I need education. Second thing, we need to be very clarity that children are a cost. And children, you have a children, before you can afford it, you cannot, you cannot create a prosperity. A person, couple gets married at 20, 20, 22, and makes one, two, three babies, they're doomed. Unless they're very, very smart and very, very well educated, or their parents are very rich. It doesn't work. You know, we, education, education, education. I think Obama, the biggest mistake he made is there, that education of poor people, one trillion people, hundred million dollars a year, okay, allocated to better schools in a poorer neighborhood, in a, in a in discriminated neighborhood like a blacks and Hispanic. It can do a lot wonder for us. It, it will pay to everybody, okay? We, 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 we haven't solved a problem, a crime problem in black community because we haven't tried, okay? But uh, Biden got elected on a black thing and doing something, he paying more attention to Jewish and Israel than black neighborhood and blacks, okay? And that is a problem. Let, let, us, let us not make a mistake that there is a racism and they see them with hurting us. Thank you. I'm done. All right. Uh, all right, Raj, you just had it. Uh, um, I think, Tim, I'd uh, like to say something I, if there's nobody else. Okay, well, Bob, and then uh, mm -hmm. let, let, okay. okay, Bob's got something. Bob, do you want to go or do you want to let Ellen go next? I don't know if Bob's still here or not. Uh, go, go ahead, Ellen. All right, Ellen, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm sorry I missed your talk, but I, I was able to come in at the end and uh, like what I heard, uh, you know, made a lot of sense. I think I'm naturally um, aligned with your, your basis of Marxism and uh, I studied a little bit familiar with um, liberation theology. And he said, that's kind of a Marxist idea, which rings true to me. Um, I was actually on the phone tonight talking uh, with Joe Kopsik, some of us y'all know, and I, it really, you know, occurred to me that I'm thinking that I sh I've debated how to, you know, address the corruption and, and predatory capitalism state we've gotten to. And I, I go between wanting to infiltrate as a Republican woman from Georgia, um, challenging Trump, but it also occurs to me to run as a communist. Um, I, I think that we heard somebody speak from the Communist Party once, and uh, I, I'm just so aware that we need to stop the war on communism. I think that's what's wrong with America and capitalism and all our parties now is that uh, this Cold War, you know, the end of the uh, World War II, we, they basically started a Cold War and um, all the deep state research I've done uh, indicates that, you know, it, they kind of conflated, well, they took the war on Hitler, and, but basically Hitler, Stalin, you know, Trotsky, Bolshevik, this, this whole war on communism is uh, just been the source of atrocities worldwide by the CIA and uh, which was built off the OSS, which was really working with the SS and the um, Hitler's head of intelligence, Reinhard Gellin was recently, um, well, they, they found the papers proving the FOIA request proved that he was right in there planning to start the, the um, basically the third world war, the cold war was a strategy of tension, false flag terrorism that America, the, the, we use the, the surveillance state, the intelligence agencies, our justice department, our military industrial complex, our national security state, all, all the intelligence agencies around the world, these puppet fascist governments that are really privatized um, 
you know, government. Uh, that's, I was just reading this Ron Paul, you know, this um, about this police state, you know, and Ron Paul introduced it, John Whitehouse. And um, he said that the, uh, you know, it's really a fascism is what we, uh, we have an invisible fascist state running things through us that is horrifying. And I, I think that maybe you can see it most clearly by the war on communism. And uh, I think we, we need to get the Supreme Court to agree that the war on communism and people must be stopped. It, it, it started with the manager's revolution, James Burnham in the thirties with the CIA, all hidden in the FBI and the NSA and the Homeland Security now and the Crown and MI6 and Mossad. I'm gonna give a talk with on the Inslaw prosecutor management information system they stole and made it into the what we now have a gang database. All the fusion centers are are use it to target the immigrants and um, you know deport them. It, we've got a basically an ugly Gestapo fascist police state. And um, like Tim, I used to be a Ronald Reagan Republican. That's when I was kind of naive. I didn't realize how corrupt and fascist Nazi we were. And um, so we just have to organize. And I do think you can see it most clearly by the war on, on people, you know, the socialists, South America, El Salvador, Indonesia, you know, East Timor, um, you know, this, we've got a Nazi thing going and main thing is to stop that by any means necessary. But I don't really believe in revolution. I kind of more believe in, um, regulation, just restoring right regulation and uh, justice, the courts, and it will trickle down from the top if we just have a kind of truth and restitution process from above, uh, looking at denazifying the world, <laughs> starting with the United States. That's all I got, thank you. It's still going. I don't hear it. I don't know. Is anybody else there? You want me to keep talking? <laughs> Tim or somebody? Bob? I guess Bob's no, ready I, to I go. guess I Bob's up him. next. I, was, I had my yeah. microphone muted. So, okay. Bob, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think um, Tim is, uh, was mostly uh, correct. Um, it is the uh, thousands and millions of little decisions that consumers make every day that are it's a, that's really the the uh, you know the democracy of of capitalism is every everything we buy it's a vote with our dollar and the uh producers look at these sales and they're signals they're signals uh of what to produce and how much and you know what color and how many and what size and all that so that that is exactly right that is why capitalism is so great at uh, fulfilling uh you know consumer needs and it rewards uh you know the producers that that are best at, at uh, uh filling those needs uh, are are the more more prosperous ones um now for uh, our speaker i'd kind of like to ask him a, a question um other question as well, and hopefully he's listening. Um, so my grandfather was a sole proprietor for all of his life, basically. Uh, he had a uh, garage next door to his house, and uh, he was a diesel uh, engine mechanic, and he worked on trucks and, and tractors in uh, Western Pennsylvania. And uh, he did this all, all of his life and supported a wife and five kids one of whom was my dad, and uh, he's passed away now. But I would just like to ask our, our uh, speaker, who was, who was being exploited? Was, was he exploiting the farmers and the truck drivers that came by to have their trucks fixed? Or were they exploiting him when they came to him to have him repair their, their engines or their vehicles? So I never quite understand who's exploiting who in that in that situation. Um, 
also, uh, as far as, you know, it's always, you know, again, like our speaker and many other lefties here on this panel, you know, they always, they're always thinking that, uh, that, you know, this, this utopia, this Marxist utopia of, you know, of equality and, and lifting people out of poverty, you know, we're always just a, a few billion tax dollars away from, from reaching that goal. And of course it never happens. We had the war on poverty, you know, in the, in the sixties and we've, we've spent money on God untold trillions on education and welfare and food stamps and section eight housing and public housing and blah, 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 blah. And we still have poverty and there's poverty all around, still around the world. Uh, why are some people productive and prosperous and other ones are not? Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's some environmental influence, uh, but there's also, unfortunately, this inheritable IQ, uh, their, their, their general level and of intelligence. And this affects uh, the way they, the way they uh, live their lives, like as far as impulse control and, uh, and thinking in the future and empathy for others. This is all tied into IQ. And this is why uh, we also have higher levels of crime uh, in, the, in people with low IQs that also have, you know, higher levels of poverty. You know, like I said, I've, you know, I've, I've been a, a legal investigator for many years. And one thing I noticed in my work is that when I see a defendant that's a total mess, I can look through the rest of his all aspects of his life and find evidence of that total mess, mess everywhere. So for instance, when I, uh, you know, collar a hit and run driver, I see that that's usually not their first rodeo, that they're not, that's not, the, not the first time they've had, you know, made bad decisions in their life. So uh, driving drunk, uh, usually they're the driving the drunk. Company when the owner of a company gets yeah, Charlie, a Charlie, you can you'll get your job. chance to speak. What's his you'll IQ? What's the IQ? Charlie, he... let him let him finish. Charlie, please. Yeah, what's the so IQ? What the owner, is... the owner gets his son a job. Charlie, let him finish. So, You're violating the one IQ. Rule, one fool at a time. IQ has nothing to do with it. Go so, ahead, Bob, and then we'll get uh, mm -hmm. after you, Bob. We're going to do one more round with Melissa, and then we'll okay. get to Ishmael. All right. So uh, anyway, so like I said, what I found is that when you you know. You get a you get a hit and run driver that does the hit and run usually because they don't have insurance uh, or because they're dr driving drunk or often both driving without a license because <coughs> they've been previously suspended. Then I also see that uh, that the guy when I call when I call to look for insurance and I call the lien holder of his car and uh, and they say you know I'm saying I'm looking for this guy he's he did a hit and run now you know what they say hey if you find him. Let us know where he's at because we're, we want to take the car back. So the guy's generally, you know, behind in his car payments. Uh, he'll, I'll find out that he'll also be behind in child support, that he's had one or more divorces if he even got married. Probably has a criminal background. Has had two or three bankruptcies. And on and on and on like like this. You know, we see that this whole, you know, this this is a whole kind of established pattern that these people have. Uh, so I, what I highly recommend doing for people like non-believers like Melissa uh, is uh, read, uh, read Charles Murray's uh, newest book called Facing Reality, where he just boils it down the, you know, the bell, essentially the bell curve, the book he wrote, you know, in the 90s, boils that down into this essential, essentially two, uh, just, you know, the two essential realities about, uh, about IQ and crime. And how we're not going to address poverty in this country until we until we you know face up to that reality uh, the, w of what we have there to work with. Now they <clears throat> you know IQ tests do work. They have been normalized. They're not just a Western culture thing. You know that's all a bunch of crap. They they've they've got all different kinds of IQ tests. They've got tests that don't even have you know that are just uh, you know using graphic images and there's even no wording on them. Um, 
and they found that you know and then this, oh, and this thing about yeah. oh well if you're born rich you know you're going to do better on the test blah 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 you know even uh, it's, they, it's you know they they they've controlled they've controlled for for all that and they even even uh, you know uh, poor poor white kids that have lower income levels than any black families for instance still score higher on IQ tests than the blacks even though the, the blacks from the, or maybe from higher you know much higher incomes maybe from family incomes with 40 or 60,000 and they and the white kids might come from a family with an income of 20,000 so i mean you can't can't just say that well you know if you're born poor then you're you know you're auto, you're automatically disadvantaged in IQ no it doesn't it doesn't work like that so so i would read that book Book and uh, and if you have a taste for it, you might want to read "Making Sense of Race" by uh, by Dutton, but that's a lot longer and a lot more complicated. But uh, but just to start off with the uh, read uh, read "Facing Reality" by uh, Charles Murray, and then I would recommend to our speaker and everybody else here, if they've not already, you need to read uh, "Wealth of Nations" or at least a, an abridged copy or something to learn about what capitalism really is and the benefits uh, you know how it's how it benefits everybody okay i will let it go for now all right thanks bob um okay uh melissa you got the i know you're doing a second rebuttal but i'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and rebut and then we'll get the ishmael no don't, don't forget to unmute well, melissa yeah i don't want to insult you but I actually pegged you from your previous comments. I knew you were going to cite Charles Murray. And I will just say straight up, that is racist. It, it's just, it's just racist, period. Like there's like grouping people by their IQ, by their race, it's racist. Like, and saying environment doesn't matter, like, okay that that doesn't make sense but to go back to the the first point environment like environment's a part of it but it's not a, it's not a huge part but it does it does it does it does make a little bit of difference let her let her finish bob like and then you're also leaving out generations of trauma from slavery and jim crow and mass incarceration And then like when you, when you talk about like the way these school systems are funded, like we have local funding, we do not have federal funding. If we have federal funding, it's very small, but like, you know, you live in a certain zip code, you have a more well-funded school because of property taxes or what other, whatever other local taxes they use to fund these schools, you end up with very un, unequal public school system and so like normally when you compare the United States as a whole to other OECD nations, we're very low on the list for math, science, et cetera. But then when you like pick out the more rich areas, the public schools in wealthy areas, we're, we're at the top of the list. Like we're, we're among those like higher, uh, those countries that are yeah, at the top of the list. It's the issue is the unequal funding and not to mention all of these parents sending their kids to private schools. So like in the, in the city of Chicago in particular, you have a, the, the black population is a, a minority, but they make a majority of the public schools. The children are majority black and brown in Chicago, even though black people are a minority in the city of Chicago. And that's because a lot of white people send their kids to private schools. So like the idea that environment is not the biggest factor, or even if you take into account, like there's been a lot of research on genetic, like the way trauma can actually affect your genes and then go through generations. Like it's not racial, it's familial like you if you are the descendant of someone who has gone through you know like all being in slavery being enslaved like going going through the slave ships like all of this trauma it gets passed down to generations there's a lot of research on that 
but to go back to the, you know, voting with your dollar point. I don't think that, I think that concept is overblown and I'm a vegan. Like, because of investors, investors will put their money where they want to. And products that they're interested in will get funded and get made. And then just like voting with your dollar completely discounts marketing. A lot of like we're constantly being influenced to buy certain things. So you can't just say, oh, we all have the freedom to buy what we want and that'll influence what companies do. Maybe there's, you know, there's a little bit of influence, but it's insignificant compared to marketing, compared to investors pouring money into certain things, it, compared to people like groups lobbying the government, you know, that makes, oh, I think a more significant impact on what actually gets, you know, manufactured. Not to mention that a lot of these companies don't even manufacture stuff in this country anymore. <laughs> like, but yeah, investors, like if, like we see that with the stock market, like who is really deciding what direction these companies are going? Is it the shareholders at the shareholder meetings or is it the consumer? That's the end of my point. Okay, all right, uh, Ishmael, uh, you got five minutes on the thing, so please go right ahead and uh, we'd like to hear what you have to say. Sure, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Rufus. Awesome. So I'd like to kind of build off what Melissa was saying there about consumer exploitation. Uh, the one thing that's really powerful that a lot of these companies have is access to our own data. Um, it's unbelievable that we're actually voting with five dollars when a lot of the data that is being collected on us when we make purchases is being fed back to us in any other social media platform we use, and even the commercials you watch on TV. If you ever notice, if you have a cable, if you have a uh, subscribe to a cable service, your data is also sold to sell you ads on there as well. For example, RCN. If I bought something probably thirty minutes ago, that same product is going to be shown on my screen in a commercial, guarantee within the next twenty-four hours. So it's a little bit hard, a little bit hard to believe that we are voting with our dollars when the same thing is being fed back to us. Kind of so, somewhat similar to like if you go to McDonald's, um, your brain is programmed to be familiar with the environment, so you want to go to McDonald's even every single time, even though the food is not necessarily going good for you. So we always have to keep this in mind that more than likely your vote is influenced by outside influences by the same system that you use to purchase the goods. And then to, I want to go to the next point to talk about uh, what uh, Bob brought up about his, his father um, starting his own business. Now, the thing is, if I'm an employee working for a company that um, pretty much I don't have any say in the labor, there's no way for me to actually have any rights other than what's granted to me by the government uh, that the company can exploit, basically exploit my labor for a very low cost. Now, a one way to kind of cap, you know, kind of count, uh, counter that, you know, that's that's a form of capitalism. A way to counter that is actually through co-ops. Co-ops grant people to actually have the ability to be able to have a say in their own in their own product, as well as they pretty much owning the labor for their product. So in, in your case, your your father is not being exploited by anyone because he is owning the means of his labor. Whereas you can also do the same thing for much larger corporations where the people who work for it actually own the means of their labor. So it's not, it's not, you know, you're bringing up a straw man in this argument to try to, to try to model what your what point you're trying to get across to basically model the argument. So there are ways to actually build up systems of value for everyone that works at the company that doesn't require the use of capitalism, just straight capitalism, even though it's still competing in the market with other capitalists, a co-op can complete, a co-op can compete in a capitalistic environment. And then I want to get to the next point about uh, the IQ, black versus white, the same, uh, the same income level. Uh, always, I mean, I don't know who else on this call is, you know, of the, of the black experience. But I lived in this in greater Chicago for 37 years. I've been in two different school systems, um, District 144 and District 228, which were suburban school system, majority black. But you can see on the wall when it was a majority white. 
these schools are well funded. And because of that, when I went to a Chicago public school, which has areas where they are not the same level of funding because of the way the school system is designed, students do poorly because of that, the way the school is funded. They have less programs that I had access to when I was in a suburban school. Now, because I had that head start, I do better in that school despite not graduating at the top of my class because I'm better trained. I'm coming from a better funded school. And where I got to my position now as being a director in a company, the reason why I got here is not because of my IQ, it's because of all the programs that were started before me. In 1960, a group of black uh, programmers got together to start an organization called Black Data Processing Associates. Because of that, because of that, them doing that, that led to me being able to get a way, get a way to teach myself how to program. Well, not teach myself how to program, but to learn how to program through an instructed led class. Because of that, because of a nonprofit organization, I was able to get education that was not available to me because it was not available in my school and not available at the next school I had to go to. So, and then on top of that, after you know I filled out of college, there's another nonprofit program that helped me get there called IC Stars. So in order to get to where I am, wasn't because of my IQ, it's because of my environment that I put my that I end up being in. Not because I put myself there, because I had access to it. There are a lot of children out there, they're just the same skin color as me, in worse conditions, in the absolute worst conditions. They on what they see on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll never be able to see anything close to what I've been through. And also the concept of how much money it is to them is, is completely different than how much money I had to deal with on a daily basis. And my experiences have been from working at a lighting company, going all the way to financial, uh, working for a financial brokerage. And I've seen capitalism at its worst. So I want to leave it at pretty much a later point because I think my five minutes are up. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Rufus. I do see Charlie wants to go again. So, Charlie, if you uh, want to do it, oh, you know, go I'll ahead. I'll be very quick. Uh, Bob Matt, are you there? He, uh, Hey, yeah, I'm, Bob, I'm, here. I'm here. Go ahead. Your grandfather was an independent contractor who performed work for a trucking, a trucking company. That trucking company, instead of hiring him as an employee, had him do work on a contractual basis. No, and he wasn't a contractor. He, he, to he, give he had his own. And he paid own. sick leave, uh, no time off, no vacation no benefits and no retirement they've been pulling that in the that's what the capitalists have been doing in particular you know it in the computer techies they're calling everybody independent contractors and they don't contribute anything and, and, and they avoid specific that's why retailers we knew in the beginning big box retailers when they came up with this term, they said, oh, they're not an employee, they're an associate. Immediately, the union organizers knew the direction they were headed years ago. They said, what in the world are you talking about? I'm no associate. I don't have any ownership. There's no stock ownership in this big box retailer. I'm an associate. No, that's all they do. And they can, yeah, it's the gig economy, is an another extension of it. And that's what that's what McDonald's was trying to say. Not only they couldn't get away with with every uh, uh, employee being independent, they said each uh, outlet of McDonald's was independent. That was in the court for years. Uh, even though a guy owned the corporation owned all kinds of McDonald's all over town, they said, oh no, they're independent. They're independent. They're one at a time. That's a that's a common strategy to preclude being the responsible employer. If you think that's great, I don't know what's ungrate. What's no good? Yeah. Well, Charlie, my grandfather was not an independent contractor for some yes, company. Yes, he was. He had his own. Your he had his own shop. His own was. business. He had his own business, and then and and he anybody worked for a in trucking there. company. No, he I worked. know those guys. I were I my landlord was a guy like that. I so I, mean, I know Fred, this. 
independent and trucking I, and I asked him, I said, why don't you get a job with the trucking company? No, they yeah. have guys that <laughs> fix trucks by my house. You can go up and down Ash Western Avenue at 39th Street, and they fix trucks, and they work for the trucking company. Well, my grandfather didn't work for any trucking companies. He worked for himself. He fixed uh, farm equipment and uh, and uh, semi tra uh, tractors. Uh, so anybody could roll in there with one and, and have work done on it. And I th think they were, my guess is that they were, I didn't live out there, but my guess is that they were mostly independent, uh, you know, truck drivers that had their own semi truck and trailer, you know, and then dr were independent truckers. And when they needed Bob, work, I'm so they would go there and have, have it done. You can What's get that? your air conditioner fixed by Sears Roebuck, or you can be fixed by Joe down the block. And you're telling me Joe down the block is a preferable stash status of employment? And that's there's no argument. That's Joe down the block would probably be cheaper, Charlie. We're talking about the expense, the conditions of employment. I know after my grandfather, yeah, we, yeah it's cheaper for the yeah for, for the guy for with years. the air conditioner. <laughs> Yeah, but it's okay years, to exploit somebody, right? For years after my yeah, grandfather retired, for years after my grandfather retired, farmers would come riding by there in their tractors and knock on the door and ask him to come out and listen to their tractor and tell them what was wrong with it. And he would Did do he it. have a retirement, a, a guaranteed annuity? No, I don't know what kind of, uh, you know, what he did to put away for retirement, but I imagine he, nobody he had some kind cared of cared if What's he that? had a dime or not, right? In retirement when he got old. They said, oh well, he got old. Yeah, he, was, had, you know, he had social security, you know. I suppose yeah, he put the money government, away. The government. Franklin Roosevelt. If it wasn't yeah, well, for the paid, government well, of the United paid into States that. well you know he, up he, capitalism. He paid into that. That was you know that's social security is something you pay into. Even if you're self-employed, you pay self-employment tax. <clears throat> you actually pay double because I used to, I had a business for many years too. And I paid, I had to pay the employer contribution and my contribution. So I had to pay like 15%. And the other thing is independent contractors. There's another thing. They always get cheated. And number two, if they displease you, guess what? You're fired instantly and you'll never get another contract if you disobey. Unless you obey uh, entirely, one thousand percent, they will, will withhold you. They do the same thing has been going on in colleges and academia. No. Come on, pal. What do you think? We don't know what's going on in the world. We know exactly what's going on in the world, Charlie, and that's called a lot of those independent contractors are businessmen, and if they don't, if they can't please a customer, they just go on to somebody else and get more. Yeah, it's no different than a baker or a you know yes. a plumber or electrician. There's a lot of guys you know carpenters working on their own that are that are uh, they're, they're they're sole proprietors. And the one thing about it is that uh, they've got to do a good job, and they get work by word of mouth in a lot of ways, and they also advertise. The but, thing but, is, but, I'd, rather, but, I'd rather I'd rather have a I know a good hey guys. Uh, last week uh, I talked to a techie. And she was getting up in years and she applied for the job with the city because she wanted an annuity. Mm -hmm. She saw that she was not getting anything by all her years of all the people she worked for. All they said was, thank you. We'll see you around sometime. I mean, just, I just want to add a point here before you guys continue on because you're talking about repairing. Go ahead, repairing. Go ahead, repairing. Um, I'm sorry. So a, a major, so major issues happening right now, especially since we have companies that can leverage their weight when it comes to manufacturing. A lot of people who had the ability to work on on tractors themselves or hire independent contractors are losing the ability because some of these companies like John Deere are making it impossible for them to actually do their own type of maintenance, and that's a big concern because as an independent contractor you lose that leverage to have to actually, you know, your own income, you're going to have to end up finding other, other things to work on or talk to your representative to do something about it. Good, good point, Ishmael. You know, I'm not against uh, 
I'm not against any of the government programs like unemployment or social security or something like that. You know, when Europe does have a lot of social safety net programs, but we also got to realize too, that when they are there, our taxes do go up. I'm just simply saying that capitalism, I think works in a lot better way than uh, it would around uh, uh, central planned economies. I, I, you know, <laughs> can I say, can I say something? Go ahead, Raj. It's not, it's not that I'm against capitalism or against uh, community, uh, socialism. The Europe has found a way, okay, by raising, asking people to contribute more, they have provided education to everybody in a decent way. They have provided health care to everybody in a decent care. They have provided housing to everybody. And we can do that too. If capitalism doesn't have to be exploitative. Capitalism doesn't have to be against a, a general welfare of the people of the country, you know. And, and if a capitalism cannot, cannot, the, the I forgot the guy's name, uh, the, my, my most famous guy, but I don't remember right now. He said that, that for capitalism to work and stay in a business in America, it has to meet the aspirations of the American people. And if it doesn't meet the aspirations of the American people, then people will oppose them. You know, during the, during the 1930s, communism rose way sharply because people felt that a capitalism is not providing them with a, what they require, basic lifestyle. And if a capitalism is to fail today in providing the aspirations of the American people, even at a poor level when they get educated, they are in trouble. If poor people in this country, if a black and browns uh, do not do not get up and their population increases, we are in trouble. Uneducated black people are more, more dangerous and black, black educated people are a great asset. And that should be very clear to everybody. Education, education. And second thing, I do not, I, I think we have to have freedom of people. You cannot, you, the government, courts, and uh, parties cannot cannot discount people because they are gay or uh, women do not want to have a baby when they do not want to have a baby to prevent them. We cannot, we cannot, this society cannot get better that way. You cannot force a woman to bear a baby for nine months and say, hey, this is my pain. That's bullshit. Thank you. Tim, Tim, it's 10 to 9. Okay, I, do you think we ought to let Charlie uh, get his last comments in then, if Charlie's yes. still there? Like Ishmael and... and uh, I am still so here. I really appreciate all you guys coming in tonight. It was uh, a good conversation. You know, I know I kind of went off a little bit there, a little bit myself, but uh, I do appreciate all the comments tonight, and I'm glad we were able to get the, get everything else. Okay, Charlie, you get the last word, and we'll adjourn at 9 o'clock. Okay, one second. Melissa and Smile, thank you for coming. Come again, please. We, yes. are, we are here every week. Yeah. Thank you. And then we, we, we like you guys to come in because, you know, this is this whole format is, is designed is for free speech, you know, and if we get it, conservatives and radicals, at least we're talking to each other, you know, and he sometimes does get into shouting, but, you know, it, it, uh, you know I, I try to keep everything calm. And thank you guys very much for attending, everybody. So, uh, can Reverend I say something Charlie? quick, Charlie? <laughs> I'm sorry? Reverend, Reverend can I say something real quick? Yeah, go ahead, and then we'll let Charlie yeah. get his last word in. Yeah, I, I just want to say I didn't um, really appreciate, like, I kind of forgot about this, but I didn't really appreciate that what seemed like a slander of farmers. Like, a lot of people enjoy gardening. Like, that's their hobby. So the idea that people wouldn't farm if they had the choice to, I think is kind of ridiculous. Like, especially now with the internet, like yeah. even if you're, I mean, we could, there is also urban farming. So, you know, I, did, I just uh, think that, you know, people, there are people who enjoy being, in, you know, putting their hands in the earth and growing stuff. And, you know, it's just the issue is the way the, we have the economy structured right now it's not lucrative so mm -hmm. well the thing is you know four percent of people produce almost all the food for the rest of the world right now and right and then that's by design because it is more profitable to do it that way so 
And, well, anyway, Melissa, like I said, you guys do make some good points. Uh, Charlie, are you ready to do your uh, final uh, word and on, on this thing? And then we'll adjourn. Sure. And thank you, <laughs> Reverend, for sticking around. I hope we didn't uh, get you too upset. Um, I just, let me, let me start with, um, Go ahead. I am sorry for losing my cool. Um, I don't have a good excuse. It just, I just, something rubbed me the wrong way and I'm in a mood. So sorry about that. Um, That's understandable. If anybody wants to have a personal conversation one-on-one -on -one with me about any of these things, reach out to me. I have put up again, my link tree uh, in the chat, which is, you know, we've got my email, you've got my, my YouTube channel, my Facebook, I'm on Facebook. Um, so, um, let's see, I, I am really tired. <laughs> we started at six o'clock and it's, and it's, it's almost nine. So um, it's been a yes, long day. Thank you. For me. Thank I, you. I, work, I work Thursdays and Fridays and um, I'm pounding the pavement for up to eight or eight to 12 hours working for a um, tour promoting company, putting up posters in businesses. And um, it, it, I don't make money doing the ministry thing that I do on Sunday nights. I did have a job briefly working um, for a church, but um, I am still looking for that kind of work. It's very difficult right now with the pandemic. Churches are struggling mightily under the pandemic conditions. Um, so to sum up where I, what I think I'm trying to do here with the Church of the Revolution is, I believe we need to have a, a new consciousness in the United States about how capitalism grinds people down and produces poverty. I, I know that there has been extended conversation about how great capitalism is. And if you read the Communist Manifesto, you will be surprised at how positive Karl Marx is at times about capitalism because he hated the system that came before it, feudalism, which was grinding poverty for you know, so many people and misery. And he preferred capitalism to feudalism. And I think he's probably right. There's, there's some debate about how bad things were under feudalism, but they were pretty bad. But Marx believed that the liberation of the human intelligence that had begun in the European Enlightenment and that had begun with the democratic revolutions that overthrew the trench monarchies and the aristocracies, he believed all that was a good thing. He just said, we need to go the next step. We need to get rid of capitalism and create a new kind of economy that he called communism. And so it's, yes, capitalism, is sort of like a glass empty, half, half empty, half full kind of thing. There have been some amazing things, you know, that capitalism has done. The problem is built into the heart of it is a need to keep the majority of people underpaid and financially exploited in order for a small group of people who own the means of production, who invest in corporations, who run banks to become obscenely wealthy and it's only getting worse. Wealth inequality is at an all time high in the United States and it's only been getting worse. And so what drives me, and again, you know, obviously since I'm a preacher and I talk about Jesus, the story of Jesus is very important to me and how you read that story is very important to me. That's probably where I got kind of ticked off because I can quote you chapter and verse. Jesus said this about the poor. In fact, my favorite preacher, um, when he was in seminary, his name is Jim Wallace. He founded a magazine called Sojourners. When he was in seminary, he wanted to do a project on what everything the Bible said about poor people. And almost, and, and the basic thing is almost everything the Bible says that poor people are poor because the rich have destroyed their lives. And he cut out every verse in the Bible that said that and put it on posters. And the thing is, is that when he was done with that project, going from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, cutting out every verse that referred to poverty, and it was usually negative, saying that poverty was a curse caused by sinful, wealthy people. 
when he was done, the Bible began to fall apart in his hands. He couldn't hold it any longer because it was in shreds. And if you read the Bible from end to end, now I'm not a big fan. I think there are parts of the Bible that are horrible, that have been used to hurt women, that have been used to hurt LGBTQ persons, and that, yes, even at times have been used to hurt the poor. So it's not, to me, it's not defending the whole Bible, but when you read what the Bible says about the poor, the message is clear. God considers poverty to be terrible. Now, who is God? God are the, is a voice that humans hear in their head. You know, like I said, I think Jesus, when he appeared, he says, I am speaking a message of universal justice to the world. And there have been many people, including Karl Marx, including Peter Kropotkin, I'll give the anarchists and the libertarian communists their due, saying that universal justice matters. I, I'm an optimist at the end of the day, even though I said the next decade, the next decade is going to be difficult. And I think it's going to be difficult because of the climate crisis, because of the political illegitimacy of the far right that is, you know, Trump was not the worst possible president. There could be somebody much worse elected in 2024. And the ecological crisis, the increasing economic inequality and the global crisis, I can't see any way that we can turn the ship around. That's why we have to begin to put forward a radical new vision. And that's to me the only thing that can satisfy the need of the world right now is to say it's time to put an end to, this, to the ridiculous headlong rush into global poverty that capitalism is generating right now through its policies and industrial practices. And please, if you have any interest, join me on Twitch on Sunday night, 7.30. Go to twitch.tv and look for Kami Preacher and you'll find me. Also go to my YouTube channel that is I listed in my link tree. Or if you want to talk or have me, I saw that somebody mentioned I could talk to the Dallas, um, the Dallas College of Complexes. I will say I work on Thursdays right now, but maybe that'll change and I can do that. Right now, Thursday wouldn't work, but maybe in the future I can do that. Um, also, I'm going to be writing a book. I've written, I've got half of it. It's half written. It's called Jesus Made Me a Communist. I'm hoping to in the next few weeks. I was hoping to have it done by tonight so you could buy a copy, but it will be published uh, in the next few weeks on Kindle and you can print it off because it's going to be using the Kindle publishing platform. A wonderful capitalist invention. <laughs> like I said, I, I, capitalism is a glass half empty and half full. It's, it, 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 it's a mixed message, and we just I just want us to go further in the direction that the Enlightenment and that science has taken us so that we can use our big brains to transform our world and to save it from destruction, because I really believe destruction is coming, and I want, I want to do whatever I can to continue to preach a message of hope and of courage and of justice and love. I'm not a, I, I believe in love. I absolutely believe in love. All right, I'm going to end it right there, guys. And I need to go. I got to right. go to the bathroom and, and all that. Thanks for having me. Reverend, thank, thank you for you. doing God it. We're going to officially close out the College of Complexes tonight. Thank you for all coming.